in this impromptu, angry event with the reporters. In the Gaza Strip, as you know, initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. Now, by, not good, obviously, but let's not forget the other candidate, the GOP frontrunner, not too long ago, confusing Nikki Haley with Nancy Pelosi. Nikki Haley is in charge of security. We offered her 10,000 people, soldiers, National Guard, so whatever they want. They turned it down. They don't want to talk about it. Yep, them. Nikki Haley didn't want it. Our number is 877-301-8970 for calls and texts. Have both of the candidates' ages become a real liability, both for them and, I would argue, for this country and its people? Politics aside, if we can try. And where do we go from here with an election just months away? The number is 877-301-8970. I watched the thing live last night at 745. It was cringeworthy. Yeah. Just absolutely cringeworthy. And when we discussed the other day, why did Joe Biden not agree to do the softball interview before the Super Bowl on Sunday in front of, what, 150 million people? I think we learned last night why he's not doing the interview. Well, you know, I read an interesting piece in the New York Times today about uh, Jill Biden uh, kind of keeping her husband from doing things that she yep, views as too strenuous. Too, yeah. She was really ticked off, apparently, about a two-hour-long press conference. Uh, ran in and said, why did you keep going so long? She talked about uh, the, the, how difficult the job is You come to be the president. I think we know how difficult it is. it is. But she talks about every single night... If, um, you're facing this pile of, of briefing books as you do with your as your vice president, which is tough, but certainly more as a president. So um, her thing seems to be, quite frankly, that he's all about not letting Trump be the president again. Which, by the way, is not insignificant as far as I'm concerned. But let me let me just say what I, I would urge you not to make a phone call today saying that, uh, that Joe Biden has done some historic things. We both agree. The issue is not what he's done, in my estimation. He's a far better president than Donald Trump would ever uh, dream of being. But that's not the issue. Trump or Biden will have to serve four years starting in January of next year. And I have to say, as a fairly patriotic American, I'm not convinced that either of these men, not their politics, their, their age and cognitive strength, uh, are ready to do this. And we know particularly a lot of you Biden people are going to be upset about that. But I would urge you before you call, if you're upset, to watch the press conference last night and see if you are still confident that uh, Joe Biden is ready to lead this country for four years. 877-301-897. Here's a little bit of Biden last night defending himself against the report's description. This is in the press conference in the, I think, the diplomatic room at 745. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president, and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. It's How totally bad out. is your memory, and can you continue as president? My memory is so bad, I let you speak. That you your memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, look, president? My memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? You know, I guess I just forgot what was going on. By the way, the line in the beginning, how bad is your memory and can you continue to be president, was from Peter Ducey from Fox, Fox News, News, which made Biden's answer joke, pretty actually. clever. <laughs> My memory is so bad, I let you speak. Uh, but that was sort of a highlight in a rather low light uh, 15 minutes. So we want to know what your reaction is. And it, it, try to resist the partisanship for 30 minutes with us, if you can, whether you're a Trumpster or a Bidenite, whatever it is. Try to do an objective analysis of what you think is their readiness to have the most difficult, stressful job for four years starting January. 877-301-8970. Well, there's no, I think for the second presidential race in a row, uh, I shouldn't say in a row because it was 2016 that, that Trump and, and Hillary Clinton went against each other and they were the two most unpopular people ever to run for president. The two parties keep giving us people that the American people keep telling them uh, they don't want, at least even in the Trump case. I mean, the MAGA people is a, is a minority uh, uh, there are a lot of Republicans that do not want Donald Trump, so we keep getting these people. But the practicalities of it are a little bit daunting. What do we do? You know, 
they'll pull the plug in the next couple of weeks? I mean, it's February. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I don't think it's too late for anything. I don't think anything's going to happen. Can I uh, say uh, maybe two more things in an attempt to narrow this discussion? For those who are going to say that was a nauseating inclusion by the special counsel to even reference these issues. We're the issue was, already. did he commit a crime or not? Uh, I agree with that. But before you voice that, he was not picked by Donald Trump. He was picked by Merrick Garland, the attorney general for Joe Biden. That, that, that's one. But I think and in number, fairness, he wanted to pick a Republican because he wanted it right. to be less but of that's a who he picked. partisan sort right, of Right, but he uh, wasn't picked inquiry. by a right winger. He was picked by Merrick Garland. Second thing is, please don't call, because my blood pressure is already high about this to begin with, saying, well, same thing, Biden, Trump. Uh, same thing with their documents. By, uh, Trump, of course, on a True Social saying that Biden's is far worse. Here's what the report itself says. Most notably, after being given multiple chances to return classified documents and avoid prosecution, Trump allegedly did the opposite. He not only refused to turn documents over for many months, he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. In contrast, this is special counsel, in contrast, Biden cooperated fully. So uh, don't waste our time with this BS argument. Uh, what, what, it, there's no question Biden shouldn't have done what he did, but it doesn't come close to the alleged criminality of what Donald Trump did. 877-301-8970. Let's start with Tim from New Hampshire. Hi, Tim. Thanks for calling. Hi, Tim. Good morning, folks. Love the show. Thanks. Um, and uh, I've called in before. So here's how I see it. We have two old dudes. And both of them are running for president. And one of them is basically a pretty good person. And the other one is a lying psychopath. Now, I don't see I don't see why this should be a problem, except for the fact that, as Hillary Clinton so recently put it in talking about Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson's a useful idiot. And he's joined by 70 million more of them that live with us every day, day in and day out. And that, my friends, is the problem. Tim, thanks for the call. We appreciate it. 877-301-8970. You know, I, I think the thing for me is um, I, I'm worried about Biden winning. I guess that's the big thing for me. I'm not that concerned. I'm worried about Biden losing. Well, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I said it backwards. I'm as bad as they are, Jim. I'll have to go and get Apparently my memory test pretty well, soon. Well, I don't think you're running for president <clears throat> last time I no, saw No, but it. the point is I'm really, I'm really worried about uh, Biden losing. And, um, but, but, but if Biden wins, I'm not worried about his winning because I think he would have people around him that would be, uh, like we said about George W. Bush, a lot of us that were really concerned about George W. Bush, people around him that would be there for him. I mean, Trump's policies are so frightening to me. Um, but this is what I'm afraid of is that, there, that he'll, he'll not get people out to vote for him. That's Joe Biden because they're so concerned about this and other detriments. John, and Gar John Gardner, hi. Good morning, kids. Hey, oh, this just in. Justin Trudeau is the new prime minister of Lithuania. Um, <laughs> so, it's fairly this, funny. This, not this, wildly okay. funny. Okay. It's fairly funny. Thank you, though. Not my best. Not my best. <laughs> Oh, my God. What's that, up, John? That was so horrible. <laughs> that was so horrible last night. Oh, it was I was cringing. Very painful. And we, as the last gentleman said, we got two old dudes, and we can look at their personalities. I'm going to vote for Joe Biden, and I'm praying to God that soon after he gets in office, he steps down or something. Think what you will of Kamala. Joe Biden is not, in my opinion, to look forward for four, he's like this now, and we're looking at four years out. I know. I mean, it's horrible that, I mean, you just said it, my, the two parties coming up with these guys, it's just horrendous. And I've, again, I've said it before, I'm so worried about Trump winning this thing now, more and well, more. Make it three of us. John, thanks. For, it's Kamala, by the way, for future reference. John, thank you much for the call. We appreciate it. Speaking of mispronouncing things, we are not in Fraser, as you and I have said. It is Fraser. Did you know that? No, I did One not. One of the most beautiful rooms in any uh, uh, media place in America. It is just great. You know, Yo-Yo Ma again, does Fraser. Fraser. Not Fraser. By the way, believe Fraser. me, that's not common for me. One of our colleagues corrected us. At least we know where we are, which is more than we can say about for uh, some fo uh, folks. 877-301-8970. What do you think about the fact that this guy, again, appointed by Garland, this guy, her, the special counsel, gratuitously raises this age and memory stuff? To, I mean, it doesn't matter that it's a total partisan hit, which it is. 
But how pathetic is it that he did play this partisan game? Well, I mean, to talk about how a jury would just feel so sorry for someone like Joe Biden, an elderly man. So they couldn't man convict when, him, yeah, right? They couldn't convict him of a crime. Uh, to me, he did go a little bit over the top. And Biden was pretty ticked off about his references to us not being able to remember when his son, Bo died. Yeah, that was died. pretty moving. Um, uh, he said, you know, he was angry about, about that. But again, I, I thought... That didn't have anything to do with classified documents, did it? Why do you need to put that in there? Well, I guess he would argue, I'm with you, but he would argue, he being her, the special counsel, would argue this is part of the reason why we didn't prosecute him, uh, even though the rest of the report, at least from my skimming of it, suggests he didn't get, commit crimes to prosecute to begin with. By the way, for those who are angry with us, and there are a lot of you about the Biden thing, it's not too, it was just a couple of days ago, he was talking about discussions with Hermit, uh, Helmut Kohl and Francois Mitterrand, the former head of France, both both of them are dead. Uh, both of them are dead. Yeah. And it's a problem. And it's a, by the way, it's not just a problem around elections. Is, is, it's a problem about governing for four more years for both these guys. Well, what do we do? What do we do? Do we say Gavin Newsom, you should run? We say Kamala Harris, you should run? Do we do a, you know, Lyndon Johnson, like uh, Lyndon Johnson went in his own accord, but should the Democrats get together and push Joe well, Biden? Well, do you remember out? the whole issue with Watergate? Is I there, do. there are powerful Republicans who can walk into Richard Nixon's office and have this conversation? I don't know if there are Democrats. You know who has been forthright about this? Somebody who obviously loves Biden, David Axelrod. We talk about him all the time. David Axelrod has honestly conveyed his concern about this issue and about last night. Obviously, most of you know he's a former chief aide to uh, Barack Obama and obviously is very close to Joe Biden, too. He has great respect for Biden, thinks he's done great things, as do I. But he's been honest around this age thing and how last night sure as hell didn't help. 877-301-8970. And the other thing that doesn't help Biden, you know, I have a lot of empathy for him because he's been a gaffe machine for many years. So I've yes, been a gaffe machine uh, for quite most of my life. Plus, he had a stutter, and I think that makes him nervous about talking in general. I think that he's dealt with this all his life. So, But the fact that this is so accentuated now is really tough. Anne from Cape Cod, thank you for calling. Hey, Anne. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning. Hi. Um, my heart sank last night. It was absolutely devastating and then went into a sleepless night for me. But regarding age, Rupert Murdoch is 92, Warren Buffett, 93, Michael Bloomberg, 81. All of these men are still, as far as we know, functioning on an intellectual level compared to many others. I'm 83, I have all my wits about me, and I'm praying every day that Biden is in and not Trump. We cannot have four more years of what we had. With well, Trump. we agree with the last, but Anne, with all due respect, uh, and I mean this sincerely, your comments about Murdoch and you are totally irrelevant. Uh, of course, there are 90-year-olds who are fabulous. We had Jimmy Carter on the show when he was in his he 90s. Was amazing. He was beyond amazing. Talk about his, talking about his book about violence against women around the world. The issue is not, are there some 90-year-olds who could be president of the United States? There probably are. The question is, does one honestly believe that either of these two guys can make it through four years in the presidency? And I, you know, again, we have the same perspective you do on Trump, but that, you know, that really doesn't, relate well, to what is, we ha heard last night. And thanks for the call. It's kind of a standing joke. You look at the way presidents look at the beginning of their administration, like Barack Obama, oh, the way he looked at the end. He made it look like he was about 12 <laughs> years old exactly with the black hair. He's a furrow brow. And the hair. I mean, W. Bush aged dramatically. Everybody aged dramatically except for Donald Trump. He That's true, aged, by the way. But not that much. And some would say it was because he was not uh, working 40 hours a day yeah. or reading all these briefing books at the end of the evening that Jill Biden talked about with his uh, Biden's tasks at the end of the day. Anyway, we're talking about the rather upsetting performance last night of President Biden in this report that called him basically a old man with bad memory. We're going to keep talking about it for a while longer. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. goers are left out from seeing what's on stage. Audio descriptions help, but they're usually in English. Efforts are now underway to make them multilingual. The bodies are sculptures in movement. Las cuerpas abrazan sus casas. Translating the stage next time on The World. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for GBH comes from you. 
and Lawrence General Hospital, where expertly trained orthopedic surgeons work together with physical therapists to help patients recover from joint, back, or neck pain and get moving. More at lawrencegeneral.org slash joints. And Explo, part magic, part summer enrichment program for kids and teens entering grades 4 through 12. Locations include Boston, New York, Oxford, and more. Information at explo.org slash summer. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie, and we're live from GBH's Fraser. We pronounce it right that time, not Fraser. the library. Even though 30 of you were just told I by know. our colleague Sandra showed up at the library. One, thank you for coming. Two, we're, and they're watching uh, the video screens there. Two, we're sorry we're not there. But if you could get Marjorie a small light roast and me an Americano <laughs> and deliver it to Guest Street, we'd yeah, be forever we apologize. grateful. We tried to announce it many times, but I, uh, not everybody obviously was able to hear it. So we're streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. It doesn't matter much now that we're streaming. It matters a lot when our musical guests join us in about 10 minutes. So if you're not on youtube.com slash GBH News or facebook.com slash GBH News, I would get there. We will be back at the library on Tuesday with Mayor Wu, who will join us for Ask the Mayor from 11 to 12. We're talking, I guess, about last, uh, by last night, uh, the special counsel said Joe Biden has not committed any crimes. I will not prosecute him, but he spoke about his memory, his age, and being an elderly person, which he obviously is. I mean, that's is what it is. And we're talking about, and, and Joe Biden did not do a spectacular job, which is the understatement of the century, at his impromptu press conference last night. And lately, we've heard Donald Trump confuse people like Pelosi and Haley confuse Obama and Biden. And there's a real question, at least in the minds of Marjorie and me, as to whether or not either of these people can effectively serve, even if you like Trump's policies, for four years starting January. We want to know what your thoughts are. 877-301-8970. I'm we sorry. Ha we haven't mentioned yet that uh, Biden was confused about when he was the vice president. Couldn't remember if he was the vice president in 12, uh, 13 or whether I mean, he was... according to special counsel. Yes, yeah. whether he's the vice president in 2009. So th those were kind of concerning things as well. John from Westford, thank you for calling. Hello, John. Hi. Hi, thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, for, first let me say I, I'm very conservative and I'm a conspiracy nut. So <laughs> I just want you to know that we love you for your honesty, yeah. John. Go ahead. It must be fun, John, anyway. Oh, it, it is. It makes it fun. So I, I think the, the whole thing was planned. Um, the, the special counsel, they didn't have to come out with that. And, and I think it was a way to get through the primary season. If, if he was to say, look, I'm not going to be able to handle another four years, which the White House knows he can't. Um, they, it, this way you get get rid of the Kamala issue. You um, can more or less handpick who you want to be the candidate. And the, the fact that he actually came out and addressed the special counsel, I mean, if he did nothing at all, it would have probably blown over. I, I think it's a little like that Barbara Streisand effect. He's drawing attention to it. Well, by the way, to add to your point, he responded earlier in the day, he did respond to the special counsel's uh, uh, report. But so your conspiracy thought is his people were even happy with what the special counsel did because it allowed them to put him out there so he could show he's not ready. Is that a fair description of your conspiracy thought? Yep. Yeah. It's, okay. It's the easy, absolutely. It's the e ease us into it a little. And, Got it. and I think it's going to be a big issue over the weekend. And something will come from it. So, John, I have a question for you um, about conspiracies. The thing that always amazes me about people who believe in conspiracies is that, you know, 90% of the time, your husband can't shut up about the, what the wife has said or the kids can't talk, keep quiet about what they've said within the family. Conspiracies always require about 100 people to keep a secret for days and weeks. What, doesn't that kind of concern you? No. No, not at all. Okay. Um, be, because <laughs> no, because it, it 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 doesn't always work that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, like like the the the, the a, a typical example I just discovered the the bio labs that the U S has been the Defense Department's just paying for in Ukraine mm -hmm. for for many many years. Um, it was a conspiracy theory, and now we know for it's a fact. Yeah. Right, right out of the mouth of Victoria Newland. Um, so there's tons of them. It goes the Gulf of Tonkin. That was a conspiracy theory, brought us into Vietnam. 
Can yeah. I tell you something? The one and, place and I'd now, agree with you, if the election hadn't been stolen by Trump, it wouldn't be in this mess. John, thank you <laughs> much for your honesty and your call. You know, okay. for those who are concerned about Donald Trump, John may be. Here's Donald Trump, where you have to give him credit for this. Here he is describing, this is in 2020, how he aced that. Remember that memory test during a Fox News interview yeah. just four short years ago? Here it is. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. They say, that's amazing. How did you do that? I do it because I have, like, a good memory, because I'm cognitively there. I'm cognitively there. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. 877-301-8970. Are you concerned, politics aside, I know that's impossible, about the cognitive abilities of the two lead candidates, the likely nominees of both parties, come November? Lynn, you're in ch- I'm sorry, Marjorie. I was going to say we're getting a lot of texts from Democrats who are extremely concerned and wish they were another person to step up to the plate. By the way, you know, Dean Phillips, Marion Williamson, pulled out the other day, Rand, he's not getting anywhere. Any of these prominent people, you keep mentioning Gavin Newsom, I assume, because he's good looking. Uh, no, because I, I think he's a pretty good, I mean, he wasn't great uh, in, in that debate he had with DeSantis, but I think he's a pretty impressive guy on his feet, and I think he's done a lot so of they, good stuff in California. There's nothing stopping him from running. There's nothing stopping him from Bernie Sanders, who, by the way, there's a perfect response Somebody to that caller. Somebody totally he's, with it. He's in the same yeah. age group. No one has ever accused him to be slowing down mentally. Obviously, every human being is different. It's not to disparage them. That's the nature of the beast. Lynn from Chelmsford. Hi, Lynn. Thank you for calling. Hi, you guys. Hi. It's been a while since we've spoken, but Glad I called. just wanted to let you know, yes, I have this intuition. I At the DNC, I said, Obama's going to run for president. When McCain got the nomination, I said, he can't pick any of these guys on the stage. He's got to pick a woman. I think at this point, it doesn't matter age. It doesn't matter who's running. We we need to save democracy. And my fantasy is Liz Cheney. He steps down. Liz Cheney takes the reins with Kamala Harris, and we have a blended ticket. We've oh. needed a blended ticket for a long time. You know and that, Lynn, for whatever it's for worth, month. we're great admirers of what Lynn Cheney did on the January 6th committee. You know that she is a hard right winger on virtually every single I issue know that. except the Constitution. I know that. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. it could happen. It probably won't. Lynn, thank you much for the uh, call. 877 301 89. So, how depressing is this, by the way? Especially since Biden is such an accomplished president, arguably the most accomplished president maybe of our lifetime, or maybe not our lifetime, but at least in the last 40 or some years. No? Yes. I mean, absolutely. Let's go to Tom in Framingham. Thank you for calling. Hey, Tom. Hi, thanks for taking the call. Thank you. Um, I, I say this as a lifelong Democrat. Um, shame on the Dems for not you know, from from day one of, of Biden's first term, anticipating this and, you know, grooming someone else who could who who could do the job um, afterwards. And I, I, if, I don't know whether that's I don't I don't necessarily think that would be Kamala Harris. I don't necessarily think it would be Gavin Newsom. But there are plenty of people in Congress who I, I, I think think Americans in general would be so much happier to vote for. And I don't know whether it's just an ego thing like. Like Biden, you know, said, well, I, I beat him before, so I'm the only guy who can beat Trump again. Um, and you'd think that, you know, there's all, always people saying, well, these people have smart people around them. And 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 where were the smart people um, sort of not foreseeing this? Well, let me just say to you, so there, there is a very smart a political analyst who worked for a president, maybe Marjorie knows who it is, who said a couple of years ago, the hardest thing in America to do for a staff person is to go to the president of the United States and tell him no. And it's really, I mean, think about it for a second. I mean, I hope that person exists too, uh, but it's a pretty tough nut to crack when you're talking to the most powerful individual on the planet, you know, Tom? Well, the thing that I, I get so angry about, Tom, is that Biden portrayed himself over and over yeah. and over again as a bridge president. Yeah, he was that, the bridge yeah. president. He was the bridge president. What did that mean? That meant he was going to uh, get in there for four years and get out, and then he, he changed his mind. So it's... it's um, 
Who'd you talk to yesterday? Was it Chuck Todd who you mentioned that to about the transition thing? And I think it was Chuck responded to you and said he probably meant that. Well, I think that is what he said when he said it. And then he served and he saw what his accomplishments were. And he concluded, I can do this again and I should do it again. Oh. Continue to continue the job I'm Let's doing. Let's bring it back locally. If people may remember that Marty Meehan ran for Congress. <laughs> president of UMass now. <laughs> yeah, and he's in much better shape now being the president of UMass financially in every other way, if you ask me. But anyway, he ran on a platform of term limits, term Term limits, term limits, term limits. And then, of course, once you get in there to Congress, suddenly the term limits went out the window. They so. needed him. <laughs> what did he say? Did he, didn't he say, Marty say he was going to serve two terms, I think? I don't remember. Whatever. And he was the cha- term limits was his calling card. <laughs> that he was, was his like the card. leader of the term limit brigade. Whoops. <laughs> well, that happens. Can I say? We have time for one more really quick one, and it's Marty in Brookline. Hey, Marty, quickly. Oh, boy, I'm on again. Uh, hey, Marty, Marty uh, good to talk to you. Yeah. Um, so, what bothers me is the conflating of memory and slight memory lapses with cognition. And uh, I think Jimmy just, um, Jim just did it himself. <clears throat> so uh, I've practiced for 50 years, as you both know, and I like to say I don't remember ever having a good memory. Uh, the, the main thing is policies and thinking. And the trouble with this memory stuff is it feeds into the triviality of modern politics. With yeah, but him. Marty, I got to cut you off because we're out of time and we appreciate your call. I, I do know the difference between cognition and memory. And I think cognition is a serious issue with Donald Trump and has been for years. And I think it currently is with Joe Biden. You are obviously entitled to disagree, but trust me, I do know the difference. Okay, we are going to uh, end this conversation right now because we want to have more time to listen to this incredible music, a real treat for Live Music Friday. We're going to be joined by two amazing musicians who will be performing with the National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine on a two-week tour across the United States starting tonight in Worcester. They're next. Check it out on YouTube. We're streaming there. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 88.97 GBH. And by the way, YouTube.com slash GBH News and Facebook.com slash GBH News for the stream. Nikki Haley lost the Nevada primary to none of these candidates. You heard that correctly. A generic nobody option beat the former South Carolina governor with 63% of the vote. I'm Katie Lannon. This week on Talking Politics, we'll talk about the road ahead for the Haley campaign after that embarrassing defeat. Plus, how former Bay State Banner senior editor Yahoo Miller aims to support local news outlets and communities of color in the years ahead. Watch Talking Politics tonight at 7 on GBH2 and online at gbhnews.org. Funding for our programs comes from you and Mass General Brigham Health Plan. Innovative plans, coverage, and a broad network of doctors. Mass General Brigham Health Plan, with you every day. For more information, you can visit MassGeneralBrighamHealthPlan.org. And Showcase Cinemas. On February 11th, you can see a screening of Malcolm X, followed by a Q&A with historian Dr. Carrie Greenidge, in partnership with the Museum of African American History. ShowcaseCinemas.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Marjorie Egan. We're live from GBH's beautiful Fraser studio. Pardon me, Fraser studio. We're not at the library because of technical problems. We will be back at the library on Tuesday when Boston's Mayor Wu joins us from 11 to 12. We are streaming now, and we really urge you to watch the streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. It's time for Live Music Friday on our show tonight at 8 at the wonderful Mechanics Hall in Worcester. The National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine will be playing their first show in the U.S. since 2020. We don't have to tell you, a lot has changed in four years for Ukraine. It's the first night of a two-week tour that will take the symphony all across the country, from Worcester to Virginia to Wisconsin, showcasing the strength and resolve of the Ukrainian people and these incredible artists. For information and to book tickets, go to musicworcester.org. Accompanying them along the way will be two world-renowned musicians in their own right who are gracing us with their presence today, pianist Volodymyr Vinitsky and cellist Natalia Koma, who immigrated to the U.S. after the fall of the Soviet Union. And as a coincidence, I guess it's not, they happen to be a couple, I should say. I think that <laughs> matters for us to know. We are honored to have you both here. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so let's start with you, Natalia. What, is it, what does it mean to you to be performing uh, with the orchestra from Ukraine? 
it's very meaningful for me because um, the orchestra became like family to us. We uh, performed the tour in 2020 and uh, we traveled together. We, uh, for example, I can tell that when we met today in the hotel, we were hugging each other and we were so happy to see each other. So it's, um, I think, also very important right now in this time to have this tour in the United States and to um, visit the uh, National Symphony of Ukraine to present beautiful music and to share our passion for music and to perform. You know, Vladimir, I'm so glad to hear Natalia say what she said at the end, because at least from my perspective as an outsider, you're not just playing incredibly music, beautiful music. You are representing your country. Does that, is that some sort, do you feel a burden from that? What does that feel like for you? I think it's very natural to represent <laughs> country. We represent both countries now, and the United States and Ukraine also. When mm -hmm. we came uh, here, uh, we represented just Ukraine. And now we became the American citizen and we represent two countries and as much as we can we work for relationship between our countries and every year before war start we visiting Ukraine for months, we give it master classes, we teach the young generation, we play with local people. We promote even American music. Mm. We brought some composers from United States and we played the double concerto written for us with Natalia yeah. uh, in, 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 Philar in Lviv Philharmonia, in Kiev, Kiev Philharmonic also. And but you're ambassadors, not just artists this yes, time. That's yes, a yes, well, yes, we are ambassadors. We try to, to help how we can help our country uh, where we were born because, you know, this is situation, that's why. Well, it's almost, I think, embarrassing for me and I'm sure for millions of Americans what is happening now in our Congress regarding uh, help for Ukraine. I mean, we've, we've all seen what has happened uh, to your country. So when you talk about that with the members of the orchestra or other people, um, particularly being in the United States now, where lots of us think we've let your country down, what do, what do people say? You know, yeah. you know, the hope is very important. I think people in Ukraine and we as well, we hope that it, still the help will come. And the everything, you know, what we hope and, um, every day, <laughs> you probably understand we, what we hope. That, yes. uh, that Ukraine will become free and uh, our people will be liberated who are under now occupation and our um, beautiful country will, democratic country, will uh, evolve to become It's hard what for you we, to talk about, what, isn't it? It's hard. Yes. Why? Yes. Why? Tell us, please. Because we, we love our country so much and we know how big the history of this and we hear so many lies coming from the other parts. Total lies about the history of our country and... Uh, from Putin we're talking about, yeah. and Putin's people, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Because... Um, now, now Putin teaching everyone history, how he <laughs> sees yeah. the historical <laughs> process, you know? Yeah. That's why some people even visiting from United States. Mm -hmm. That would be know? Tucker Carlson. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Uh, yes. He needs education from Putin, <laughs> you know. That's why... <laughs> well, the you, thing is, I'm sorry, Margaret. Uh, that's why we... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm no, here. you go, go ahead. ahead. We just try to deliver the real history, how it was. And, and, uh, and the, the other thing is, it, 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 I would think, that makes this so difficult is because of the long relationship between Russia and Ukraine. People living in, 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 in both countries, the languages and all that kind of thing. It's not like uh, the United States and Iraq, which is halfway around the world. You know what I mean? Uh, yes, you, you think correct, because it's too far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Iraq> and, <laughs> and sometimes, you know, the distance from Ukraine to some point of Russia is the same distance. You know, that's why it's different. And little. brothers and families on both and sides. Some, yes, but many, and uh, we studied in Soviet Union yeah. during yes. Soviet Union. But this was big difference, Soviet Union, because the 
also the each culture has influence to this huge um, Soviet Union, like it was 15 Republic. Republic. It just delivers the best people to Moscow. That's Moscow Conservatory was one of the best in the world in this time. Can I? You're going to play for us uh, a couple of things. We'll get to that in about one second. But since you mentioned relationships, you still have a sister. You're from Lviv, both. Yes. Both of you. yes. you still have a sister there. Well, Vladimir has sister. Oh, you have a sister. I, I have a. Yes. And how how is your family doing? No, you know, when the war yes. started, my mom passed away oh, because, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, no, she was she in age, but you know, heart was, you know, damaged. But news from the war, uh, from from the conflict, from the news every mm-hmm. day, she emotionally she cannot exist mm-hmm. more. And my sister still there until today. Sometimes she running to shelter, mm-hmm. you know, to. To save life, <laughs> and sometimes, but the people changes there. You know, now it's even in orchestra ISIS of musician. I wrote, you know, this is resisting now more. Yeah. And Some of the musicians are fighting. Are they, are they not? Some members of the symphony yes, orchestra yes, are yes. fighting for their country. Uh, yes, and not just musicians and actors and yeah. uh, directors but of movies and uh, poets. <laughs> poets. Uh, Okay, can we get to the music? We yes. really, we are yeah. done, because we heard you. Are you playing first solo? Is that what you're doing? Yes. And then you're going to play together in a few I minutes. Will, uh, first, I will play a short uh, prelude by Ukrainian composer Lev Rivutsky. It's uh, like post-romantic period in our history. Because I think it would be interesting to you. It's not very known music Great. around, and we try to deliver now you said we are ambassadors. We will try. That's our right. Great. So <laughs> you can go to the piano, and yes. we'll talk to Natalia while you're yes. setting up. I okay. I have to take off yes. my hat. Oh yes, yes, yes please. You do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Natalia, what do you hear from from friends and family at home? Sometimes you know the news are very sad, and yeah. uh, we uh, every day when we come home uh, after work, we work in in. Charleston, in College of Charleston, we professors South there in South Carolina. Every day, that's how uh, our day is. We, we come in, we have dinner, and we are watching news from many source, sources yeah. because we want to have the vision what's, you know, really going on. And from one source, it's very difficult. So, we, of course, Volodymyr sp- speaks to his sister, and we have many friends. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we call them, they call us, and... Uh, Should we listen to uh, Volodymyr play? Here he is, Volodymyr Vinitsky. Welcome.
Russell. Oh. Oh, my goodness. Who, along with his wife, who is with us here, world-renowned cellist Natalia Koma, will be performing with the National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine tonight at 8 o'clock at Mechanics Hall in Worcester. And uh, you can get tickets at musicworcester.org. Not only was that incredibly beautiful, it was incredibly beautiful watching you <laughs> perform. It really was. What do you think of that piano? Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, piano, just, amazing. Do you know, just, uh, get closer to the microphone, do you know that when Marjorie and I were here, the first day we were here many years ago when they were attempting to hire us and they brought us in this room to impress yeah. us, they told us not to touch the piano. <laughs> I want you to know, do you understand that? You have to touch. <laughs> <laughs> not because us. The piano needs to touch to, you know, to, to, to deliver the Yeah, sound. for you, not for us. <laughs> Natalia, can I, you know, we have had leaders of the Boston Symphony Orchestra are here regularly, and uh, they, from Andres Nelson's Keith Lockhart, everyone, and they talk about how important music is in all times, but particularly difficult in times of pain. And so I'm wondering, back home in Ukraine, when we say we know, I know the the music school at Kharkiv was destroyed, and so many other atrocities. Mm -hmm. How important is music today as this struggle for survival goes on? I think music has healing properties. You know, for example, me and Volodymyr, we cannot live without music. Our life is dedicated to music, and music makes us mm, maybe uh, happy at times. But when you are sad, you know, and you p perform, it it calms you down. And of course, the music has very—it's uh, a means of communication. Mm -hmm. You communicate, communicate with people. Of, from all over the world without the words, and it's very powerful. Yeah, we want to leave time for your second piece, but I'm, uh, what can people expect tonight up in Worcester at Mechanics Hall? Uh, I will play uh, the Saint Saint's uh, second concerto, number two, in G minor. But here in studio, we will play something different. Okay. Yes. okay. And it and was my suggestion. I <laughs> to, to tell. Wait, what you're playing here? Yes. What are you playing here? You tell us. Volodymyr wrote this piece, and it's called Wartime Tango. Mm -hmm. Because when Tango. we were, you know, he all, Volodymyr likes to improvise. And his improvisations are beautiful. The melodies, and mm -hmm. not only the rhythms and the harmonies are incredible. And some of them, I said, please, write it down. So... He wrote a couple of pieces which were actually published. What do you mean actually published? This is a wildly talented man. You're surprised <laughs> that this <laughs> work could be actually published? Is no, that no, what you're I, saying, Natalia? No, I mean, he didn't even think about public. I actually told him, you have to write it down and, you know. Do you, He's can making I ask you a face over there. Do you want to correct the record here at all? <laughs> no, she is right. Okay. You okay. Know. Can okay. I ask you one more question about the ambassador part of this? And maybe this is naive because I'm not a musician. Marjorie played the piano when she was young, and she may understand it more. She's still young. She, well, she, <laughs> well, she, that was a setup much. one. Thank you. Do you are you when you're playing? I know you, I was watching you. I know obviously your laser-like focus on your cello, your piano. But are there times that what enters your thoughts is who you're playing for, too? I don't mean the audience in Worcester alone, but for your people. Does that, does that ever enter your head, Natalia? Does it? No, of course, you know. But if there are many people, you, you just try to perform your I mean, with your heart and your soul. And that's what, um, you know, you just try to touch people's hearts. How do you like playing with him? Oh, the, <laughs> the, the best. How do you like I playing do. with her? The same. <laughs> so, so tell us one more time what you're going to play, Vladimir. We will play, uh, it's called Wartime Tango. Uh, oh, why Wartime? Because, uh, first name was maybe Nostalgic. Nostalgic or something, Tango, because something, it's But very we sad. changed the name. And uh, it's what? Tango is dramatic music, always. It's drama there. We're dance, ready. Dance, of, dance yeah. for two okay. <laughs> until death. <laughs> Can I tell you, it was an honor to meet you both, and it is really an honor to hear you play. So you Thank may you. take your headphones off, gently put them down. You can go to your cello. You can go to your piano. Wartime tango coming in a couple of... 
of seconds. You want to tell people how they can get tickets tonight Yes, again? if you want to get information or tickets about the concert, the website is musicwister.org, and Vladimir Verninsky and Natalia Koma will be performing tonight at Worcester's Mechanic Hall with the National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine, and they're going to perform for us right here in Fraser. 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 By the Fraser. way, it's a, Mechanics Hall is like, a beautiful venue. You ever been there? It's a really nice... It's not Fraser Hall. Nothing is Fraser well, Hall. I'm at, I'm at uh, Fraser Hall here with the acoustics that are through the roof, and we're going to hear them play for us right now. Welcome to you both. Thank you.
You have just heard Vladimir oh. Vinitsky and cellist Natalia Coma. They're going to be at Worcester's Mechanics Hall tonight to get tickets. The website is musicwister.org. They'll be performing with the National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine, Worcester's Mechanics Hall, worcestermusic.org for info and tickets. After the news, GBH is Callie Is that Crossley. spectacular or is that spectacular? Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And ABCD, a nonprofit organization bringing energy services to low-income residents statewide, committed to helping people get from where they are to where they want to be. BostonABCD.org slash empower. I'm Deputy Investigative Editor Jennifer McKim, and you and I are listening to 89.7 WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you? I'm Jim Bradley, head on Boston Public Radio, not at the Boston Public Library, but yes, on YouTube, GBH's Kelly Crossley is here. Then the culture show's Jared Bowen discusses various arts events around Boston, the Queen of Versailles at the Anderson Colonial, machine learning at the Central Square Theater, Hunter Biden's art, and of course, we'll talk about the death of legendary longtime BSO conductor, Sergio Ozawa. I'm Marjorie Egan. Then Marcella Garcia from the Boston Globe on immigrants in Massachusetts. Why more in Roxbury, not in Wellesley? U.S. visa help for the children of a missing East Boston woman and more. And then Irene Lee and my do join us ahead of their Lunar New Year events this weekend at May May Dumplings. Lion dances and celebrations and lots of dumplings. Oh, great. All that, plus why you're probably calling in sick the Monday after the Super Bowl. That's next on Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. President Biden won't face charges for mishandling classified documents, but the special counsel investigating him criticized Biden's mental acuity in his final report. NPR's Asma Khalid reports Biden held a press conference last night to try to contradict that impression. The report describes Biden as a, quote, sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. The president responded. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president and I put this country back on its feet. Biden was defensive as reporters asked him blunt questions like, is your memory getting worse? He's 81 and he often mixes up people and names. It even happened last night when he was responding to a question about Israel and Gaza. Polls have repeatedly shown many voters are concerned about the president's age. Biden's likely opponent in the presidential election is Donald Trump, who at 77 also faces questions about his mental sharpness. Asma Khalid, NPR News. Trump's been celebrating legal and political gains this week as the only major candidate competing in Nevada's GOP caucuses. Trump secured all of the state's Republican delegates after having done the same last month in New Hampshire and Iowa. Trump also appeared pleased with how things turned out in the U.S. Supreme Court, where his attorney presented his case for allowing Trump back on the primary ballot in Colorado. I think they had a very, very interesting day and a very beautiful day, perhaps. I think it was really a very beautiful sight to watch. Yesterday, the nation's top courts seemed to express skepticism about Colorado's arguments defending the state's Supreme Court's decision to remove Trump's name from the primary ballot. That court cited the 14th Amendment and raising concerns about Trump's actions surrounding the 2021 insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Russian President Vladimir Putin says Moscow is open to negotiations that could see the release of jailed Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. Putin's comments came in a lengthy interview with former Fox News host Tucker Carlson. NPR's Charles Maines has the latest from Moscow. Tucker Carlson's two-hour interview with Putin saw the Russian leader make familiar false justifications for his invasion of Ukraine, yet it also provided Putin's most extensive comments to date on the arrest of Wall Street Journal correspondent Evan Gershkovich. When asked by Carlson if he would free Gershkovich as a gesture of his decency, Putin demurred, noting negotiations with the U.S. were ongoing. He then suggested Moscow could be open to a trade that included a suspected Russian government assassin currently serving a life sentence for murder in Germany. 
Putin also insisted Gershkovich had been caught red-handed gathering intelligence for the U.S. Secret Services. Gershkovich, the Journal, and the U.S. government all vehemently reject that charge. Charles Maines, NPR News, Moscow. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 151 points at 38,574. From Washington, this is NPR. Good afternoon. With the latest from the GBH Newsroom, I'm Henry Santoro. The Boston Symphony Orchestra has released a statement regarding the passing of their longtime colleague and conductor, Seiji Ozawa. It reads, in part, with great sorrow, the Boston Symphony Orchestra announces the death of its beloved music director, Laureate, Seiji Ozawa. The Boston Symphony Orchestra's longest-serving conductor, holding the title of music director for 29 years, from 1973 to 2002, Maestro Ozawa. Died February 6, 2024, in Tokyo. He was 88 years old. And we have a program note that in honor of Maestro Ozawa's extraordinary life, our sister station, 99.5 CRB Classical Radio Boston, will air a special tribute to him beginning at 8 tonight, celebrating his legacy with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Four members of the BSO will tell stories of the memorable recordings that they made together. That's tonight at 8 on 99.5. CRB, and, of course, more on Seiji Ozawa with Boston Public Radio coming right up. As you get ready for lunch, I want to let you know that today, February 9th, is National Pizza Day. Whether it's Thin Crush, Chicago-style deep dish, or anything in between, pizza is without question an American favorite. Pepperoni, the most popular pizza at 36% of all pies sold. Over 3 billion pizzas are sold in the U.S. each year. Add another 1 billion on store-bought frozen pizzas. And the very first pizzeria, Antica Pizzeria, opened in Naples, Italy in 1738. Why not pick up a pie with your favorite toppings tonight, snuggle in, and watch the trifecta of pizza movies, Mystic Pizza, Pizza A Love Story, and Liquish Pizza. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Fisher Investments. Fisher is committed to helping clients stay on track to reach their financial goals and enjoy a comfortable retirement. FisherInvestments.com. Investing in securities involves the risk of loss. Marjorie Yeagan, welcome to our number two of Boston Public Radio. We are broadcasting today from the F- Fraser. 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 No, Fraser. 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 GBH's Fraser uh, studio, not the Boston Public Library because of technical difficulties. And we apologize to the people who went to the library today. We're very, we're very sorry. But we are streaming on YouTube.com slash GBH News and Facebook.com slash GBH News. And we're going to be back at the Boston Public Library on Tuesday with Mayor Michelle Wu, the mayor of the city of Boston, for another edition of Ask the Mayor. The mayor will be with us from 11 to 12 on Tuesday. Hello, Marjorie. You're supposed to say hello, Jim. Hello, Jim. Yeah, let me just say one thing. You just heard some of the most powerful music from the soloists who are going to be performing with the National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine tonight at Mechanics Hall in Worcester. We just heard during the break a bunch of young people who are going to perform a lion dance. You better be watching this on YouTube or Facebook. A lot of young people are going to perform a lion dance on in the 1 o'clock hour on this show in honor of uh, Lunar New Year, and they're going to be joined by uh, Irene Lee from May May. It's going to be a great time. So we hope you'll be with us. And again, we hope you're watching the stream. Uh, first, GBH's Kelly Crossley is joining us. She's the host of Under the Radar with Kelly Crossley, which you can catch Sunday nights right here on 89.7 at 6. You can also hear Kelly commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. And, of course, she's co-host for The Culture Show, which airs every day here at 2 o'clock on 89.7. Hello, Kelly. How are Hello, you? Hello, Jim. Hey, Marjorie. Hey, Kelly. So uh, <laughs> we've talked a lot about President Biden's mm. age. A lot of people are very concerned about it. They became more concerned last night after uh, this new report on whether or not he had taken uh, – documents uh, from the White House, classified documents, a lot of talk about his memory lapses, not remembering when he was vice president, what years he was, not remembering the year in which his son died. What's your takeaway from this? I thought that was so inappropriate to put that a piece of it. You, I mean, his report should have been um, he is not criminally liable, um, and here is the deal. But to say go on and on about, you know, he's got some elderly concerns. Um, By the way, I'm not a doctor, but the last time I checked, you had to have more than loss of memory to say that you have a failure of mental acuity. Am I 
Is that your well, you know, Marty Rosen, I think I can say his last <laughs> yeah. name, Marty Rosenthal, yeah. who's a lawyer for a half century from Brookline, called at the end of our discussion. I don't, I, with I, utmost respect for President Biden, maybe less so for Donald Trump, I don't think it's just a memory issue. I think there is a cognitive issue. When we got into this Egypt versus Mexico okay, thing. But, like, but what I'm saying is to put it in the report. Oh, oh, totally so that's, that's inappropriate. But it so, was in yeah, the report, okay. and Biden yeah, responded. What yeah. did you think of the 745 press conference last well, night? Well, I mean, you know, that's an. It, but, you know, I look at myself and think I'm one of the few people in my little group that can remember other people's phone numbers. Everybody else has it in the phone, and if they don't have it, they're, they're out. Um, now, can I walk from this room to that room and say, what I'm in there for? Perhaps not. <laughs> so, you know, you... Are you thinking you're running for president? Though no, I don't remember no. if you hadn't told us. So you're no. not. Let's just be clear. Well, okay. that's true. That is a good point. Um, and I would also say there have been some unqualified folks um, who've commented on uh, uh, former President Trump's mental acuity as well. So, but it wasn't in a report. You know, I just, I think that's Well, the just, report yeah, was totally creepy. Yeah. You know, you reminded me of something we should have said when we were discussing this with our listeners. We've been discussing with Art Kaplan for, what, a decade, what Art Kaplan has lobbied for. Not only physical exams done by independent authorities like used to be done years ago by the major presidential candidates and without violating their privacy reported to the public. Nikki Haley's right. I don't know if 75 is the right age. She obviously picked that because they're both over 75, Trump and Biden. There's got to be some age where the American people are entitled to the candidates taking a cognitive test. And if they don't do well on it and you're okay with that, that's your business. You're allowed to vote for whomever you want. But wouldn't that be an important asset in consideration of who you think the next leader of the country should be? I'm not going to deny that. I think absolutely. Um, what, if that's going to happen, however, is something else again. Of course. And so here we are at this moment with, with these choices, as many of your callers said earlier, and that's that I think is uh, why people are really upset is that they you know didn't have a choice to say definitively hey uh, neither one of these guys maybe should be the candidate at this moment. Yeah. We're talking to Kelly Crossley. So it does seem as though the Supreme Court is not about to take uh, Donald Trump off the ballot from what we did. Gathered. You think they would? Uh, you know <laughs> I didn't really think that they that they would. My theory is that they but they are not going to take this case on immunity and let the uh, ruling from the lower court stand that the president is not immune. That's my, that's yeah. my hope. That they'll split the baby. Yes. We have some sound from yesterday, significantly from one of the liberal justices, former head of Harvard Law School, Justice Kagan, asked the attorney for Colorado, Jason Murray, about why one state should decide who the next president could be. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. In other words, you know, this question of whether a former president is disqualified for insurrection uh, to be president again is, you know, just say it. It sounds awfully national to me. Awfully national to me. Awfully national. So did you think that they might do something unexpected? I, th I, I thought the minute it went to the Supreme Court, he was in. He was golden for whatever he wanted. Though I am, int I am uh, intrigued that a number of them, which could mean that people that you don't think might have supported that, may uh, because of this whole the state court business um, and that uh, there a lot of them believe that just state courts should not be, have a, any say about it, period. Yeah. Um, and so there you have it. The other big argument, it wasn't about what the Supreme Court would do, it was about whether this would be good for the country, that if the Supreme Court were to decide it shouldn't be on the ballot, yeah. you know, they'll be held to pay because the courts that people don't have a lot of trust in anyway, the Supreme Court right now is going to decide these things. David Axelrod was one of those people, a bomba guy, that said that shouldn't happen, and he said that what should happen is the voters should decide. And I, and I get that. On the other hand, um, uh, if they got him off the ballot, then it would be difficult for the president. Well, here's the other practical thing. I just think now is going to be tough. I mean, so what do you do? The ones have already done it. What do you go? I mean, I, 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 I don't see how that works technically. It should be able to, whatever the court says, that I guess that should be it. But I, the minute it went, ascended to the Supreme Court, I thought he's going to get exactly what he wants, um, no matter what many constitutional scholars have said. You mean Trump's going to get yes, exactly yes, what he yes, wants? Um, is not the case. And by the way, so, let us say, you yeah. never say too many times, this is about the hundredth, that a husband of an insurrectionist is going to be part of the nine people uh, right. making a judgment here. Clarence Thomas's That's wife, right. as we know, was uh, a supporter of the insurrection right. everywhere she could. And as always, Clarence Thomas, who does not care much about ethics or recusal, will not be recusing uh, himself. Speaking I, I, of 
I think I'm you sorry. should underscore that vocal. I mean, hugely vocally supportive, not just kind of quietly. No, that's true. You know, she's dealing with Mark Meadows, yeah, the yeah. chief of staff. She's right. writing to legislators right. in Arizona. Yeah. She was an active participant in the yeah. effort. Speaking of uh, clueless people, I think we were. Mm -hmm. uh, Tucker Carlson goes to wow. Russia to interview uh, Vladimir. Putin. It was his first interview with the Western media outlet since Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022. Here is a little piece of that interview. And so why don't you just call Biden and say, let's work this out? If you really want to stop fighting, you need to stop supplying weapons. It will be over within a few weeks. That's it. And then we can agree on some terms. What's easier? Why would I call him? What should I talk to him about? Or beg him for what? And, and what messages do you get back? You're going to deliver such and such weapons to Ukraine? Oh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Please don't. What is there to talk about? By the way, the Washington Post, oh, which is yeah. a pretty good newspaper, said him. <laughs> Carlson spent most of the interview yes. in silence or looking confounded. Yes. And, and, you know, uh, some people wrote, Kelly Crossy, the only moment where uh, Carlson asked an important question was when he asked about uh, 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 Evan Gerskowitz, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, who obviously is in prison, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And a wonderful point was made by the Wall Street Journal in response to the question, is Carlson acknowledged that he had broken the law when he hadn't broken the law, just in his question. So even that question was weak and uh, pathetic. What's your take on this well, whole I couldn't get disaster the that he didn't ask a single question about Russia's attack on uh, on uh, civilian areas uh, or critical infrastructure in Ukraine that if you don't ask anything else that seems to me to be the basic question that you ask and then the other part of it was he's asking him whether any world leader could be a true Christian I'm yeah, sorry. That's an important well, question. <laughs> yeah. I just don't understand so, what, what that has to do in this conversation. So I'm not sure the number of followers Carlson still has. Millions and millions. He yeah. left. Many millions. Right. Many millions. I, I, I don't know. How, uh, will this play Did y'all already well? say he's former... Uh, former Fox, Fox News yeah, guy, right. 8 yeah. o'clock guy. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's no longer there because uh, uh, he got uh, axed in the uh, lawsuit when Fox lost almost a billion dollars for repeating the lies about the election. Right. But um, do you think this... this gives his followers pause or do they just no. they like the MAGA people that just whatever I think because he's talking to Putin they will say oh look how big he is he can talk to Putin he can get Putin to talk to him and I think the content of it somehow does not get focused on in the way that it should um, so that there can be you know, people, I mean, just the one question about not asking about Russia's attacks, everybody, um, even even people who don't know much about it, know that. And to have not asked about that is I wonder, important. You know, can and, I, and then, of course, the, the people that want to fund Ukraine in the Senate are doing exactly what Putin is hoping that they're going to do. Too. Right. You can't help right. miss that. Yeah. Exactly. You know, uh, by the way, he's got 12.1 million followers. I just looked it up on, on the Twitter. You know, uh, Marjorie, you and I were talking about a, a story you've told me a lot of times when you're at the Herald. You all understand the relevance of this. When you wrote a column that you thought was not a good column, yeah. you'd go into the newsroom with your head down, hoping nobody would make eye contact with you because mm -hmm. you were so embarrassed, even though half of them probably never read it anyway. And by the way, it was probably a pretty good column, just not up to your standards. Yeah, some of them were pretty how bad. How does a guy actually. like, and also, I mean this sincere, how does he live with this? I mean, even if it plays it. to, do you really believe I he believes at this? At this point, he believes it. Well, that really, would be, it's a it, yeah. pathetic, but I mean, yeah. if it's true, it's horrifying. Well, Chuck Todd but, you know. thought yesterday that he had a screw loose, that there was something mentally wrong That he's mentally ill. See, him. that's what I, 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 I can't, I don't know if he has kids or, I don't know how you can face... Normal, he does or he doesn't. He does. So how does he I face those he kids? No, he has, no, he has kids. Yeah, okay. Because right, remember when he got in that back and forth about somebody was stalking him Hit and he the had house. To, you know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thing. yeah. So okay. no, he has kids, and you know, he, though he has the nerve to attack other people's children. <laughs> that's that's another story. But no, he no. I, I so he lives with himself because you believe <clears throat> he believes this I do. sickness and that the fact that he got this interview is a big deal for him, it is. and he feels uh, bigger and more important. Here's what I think it came out of this that the Washington Post also uh, underscored that I think the rest of us can take away from. It is very clear that Putin is not moving from his position. And so that should be information that the folks who are sitting on making a decision about whether to give new funds or not should really pay attention to. You know, one you know. of the things for those I hope people were watching earlier on uh, YouTube or Facebook. 
Were you watching Natalia's face when she was talking about her she country hardly, and her country people? She was yeah. close to tears. I mean, you look at that, a human being, a wildly talented human being, but just an average person who's got a lot of talent, just talking about the people she loves, the country she loves, the country she's from, as opposed to this monster. And this guy decides, for whatever reason, to give him an audience well, and crow about it. How embarrassed do you feel as an American? What we're doing to these you people? You mean even though he's not our cup of tea, right. the fact that he's there being his patsy? No, no, no. What we're doing to Ukraine? Oh, we're, oh, we're, oh we're, yeah. we're pulling the rug out from underneath them. No. I mean, yeah. the people in the, mostly Republicans mm -hmm. in the Senate are, are just mm -hmm. saying basically drop dead, literally, to Ukraine because that's what's going to happen oh, if dear. they don't give them money and they don't get more weapons. And it's just a tragedy. I know. So Jim asked the question: What you know people would take away from this? I wonder would would the GOP Republicans look at this and see his determined Putin's determination to know. stay in and understand what that means or not? How would this know. be interpreted from there? Vantage point is what I'm. Well, I don't think interested. they were concerned, at least from what I read, from those who are now against any aid for Ukraine. I think their position is uh, it's it's fine if Russia uh, yeah, keeps Crimea saying. and these other places. So, that's what so they this, buy into. Yeah, so this is this uh, underscores is what they want to hear. That you know this guy is not moving, but uh, so would you have a, another thought about that? You know what that means. He's pretty recalcitrant here. I'm not changing my mind. I don't know how they you live know. with themselves either. Forget Tucker Carlson, how the people who oppose yeah. further aid to these people fighting for their freedom and their lives is just unbelievable. You know, can we come back home for a, a, a final mm -hmm. thing here? Uh, maybe the only person who eats out as much as I do, maybe you. Yeah. And uh, I think you're a pretty good tipper. I know it's one yes. of the things I'm proud of. There is uh, legislation here to join a handful. I think it's a small handful of other other mm -hmm. states, where the tip wage is no longer the sub-minimum wage because you get tips, mm -hmm. but it becomes over time the minimum wage on top of which you get tips. I don't know what the status is right now. It's not about to pass imminently. What's your take on this? Uh, good. Do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I have been in restaurants. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is anecdotal, and you know, researchers would say, "Don't be bringing your anecdotal stuff here." But Fine I with just, us. <laughs> but I'm just saying that. Haven't you been in those situations where you are looking at, first of all, there's labor shortages, so you see the people in the restaurant, they are running around like crazy trying to make sure they attend to everybody. And I have actually watched people not tip so to the I. level of service so that they are I. providing. And there's so few of them, and they're working so hard, and they're trying to make sure all your needs are taken care of. And I just don't get it. And the reason they have to work that hard is because it took so long to get to $15 an hour. And so this, I mean, we have to wake up and smell the coffee. If people want a living wage, help people have a living wage. Okay, so the restaurateur, know. and we've had a ton of them yeah. on the show, particularly the independent restaurateur, saying, I totally support it in the abstract. Can't it. I can't afford it. And the only way I could afford it is by next time you, Jim, or Callie yeah. go out to dinner, you're going to pay 15% more. You willing to do it? I, I'm, yes. You I'm think the average well customer aware. is? Perhaps not. But then again, you know what? Going out to dinner is, is your choice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think there is enough other people who would support and continue to support because, you know, if they understand and they do what, this, what this, the real scenario is. Um, I, 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 don't, I just don't know how people can go in now and not acknowledge uh, what the scenario is and not acknowledge that this is not a fair wage and people really need to have that. I... I we, we just got to work it out. I'm and, with you. you know, I'm with all. you. Hope okay. it happens. We'll talk yeah. more about it with the people involved yeah. in uh, so the near future. I hesitate to even ask Callie Crossley what's going on the culture show because last week she slapped No, we're not down. allowed to ask her what's no, going on the culture show. I'm looking show. at Jared Bowen across this room. There he is. I see him. <laughs> I will be saying nothing. Okay, okay. good. I'll be saying nothing. <laughs> How about your How show? How about a preview on Sunday night? What are you doing from 6 to 7 Sunday night here on GBH? I'm doing a, uh, my LGBTQ roundtable, um, and we're talking about uh, one story that just got me in Great Barrington about the police raiding a middle school yeah. because of a book um, I, with LGBTQ content. So that's that and other stories. But also we have Michelle Norris on with her oh. great book, um, Our Hidden Conversations, What Americans Really Think About Race and Identity. And what she says in that book and demonstrates is that people are having the conversation about race, just not out in the open. Um, and that's what her book is there. And also our CEO, Susan Goldberg, will be on to talk about the Reckoning and Repair Multi-Year Initiative as well. 
Terrific. Mm. Yeah. Sunday night. Yeah. Nice to see yeah. you. Thanks so much, Callie Crossy. Thank Appreciate you. it. Callie Crossy, thank you very much. We've been speaking with Callie Crossy. She's host of Under the Radar with Callie Crossy, which you can catch. We just spoke about this Sunday nights right here, 89 7 at 6 o'clock. And Michelle Norris this weekend on our boss, Susan Goldberg, mm-hmm. star studded uh, show. Mm-hmm. You can also hear Callie's Callie commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. And Callie is also co host of GBH's The Culture Show, which she refuses to tell us anything about. But Jared Bowen is there. Jared is sitting across the room. <laughs> He might have a word or two to say. It airs daily at 2 o'clock on 89.7 GBH. Thanks, Callie. Coming up, the aforementioned GBH executive arts editor, Jared Bowen, host of The Culture Show. He's going to be with us. Um, He's going to speak about The Culture Show, but he's also going to speak about one of the greats, the death of the famed Boston Symphony Orchestra conductor, Seiji Ozawa, listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Craig Lamolt in for Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, the Boston Symphony Orchestra's iconic former conductor Seiji Ozawa has died at age 88. State officials are considering a new temporary shelter site in Fort Point. And Lunar New Year starts this weekend. We'll hear how locals are celebrating. Those stories in all the day's news starting at 4 on GBH's All Things Considered. Support for our programs comes from you. And Mass General Brigham Health Plan. Innovative plans, coverage, and a broad network of doctors. Mass General Brigham Health Plan. With you every day. For more information, you can visit MassGeneralBrighamHealthPlan.org. And Mass General Cancer Center. Dedicated to providing compassionate care and cancer specialists who are experienced in the cancer you have. When you hear the word cancer, their team is ready. Learn more at MassGeneral.org cancer. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie again. We're broadcasting live from GBH's Fraser Studio, not the library. We have some technical issues. They should be resolved by Tuesday. And when they are, the mayor will join us from 11-12. That would be the mayor of Boston, of course, Michelle Wu. One little factual update. I don't know if it was on the news earlier because I wasn't listening to it. Uh, Obviously, control of the Senate is uh, very tight. As the moment, one vote majority for the Democrats. Ben Cardin is a Democrat from Delaware, uh, Maryland, pardon me. He's retiring. And Larry Hogan, the former governor, who is wildly popular and a sane Republican. Excellent. But excellent. A, well, no, it's not excellent because even though he's a sane Republican, if he were to win, uh, the Republicans would likely have a majority. So he may not be out of his mind, but his colleagues are. So I'd say not excellent. But in any case, uh. Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Larry I thinking, Hogan. I was thinking he might be able to last yeah, yeah, some I'm of his sure, fellow sure he will, of course. Uh, Republicans that maybe aren't so sane. You know, in any so. case, uh, he's announced that he's running for the Republican nomination for the Senate. We're joined now by Jared Bowen, GBH's News' executive arts editor and host of The Culture Show that airs daily at 2 o'clock right here in 89.7. Hello, Jared. Great to be with you both. And you too. So I'm stealing the lead from the New York Times. Seiji Ozawa, the Japanese conductor who took the Western classical music world by storm in the 60s and 70s and was long time music director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra from 73 to 2002, has died. Uh, He was 88 years old. Tell us about uh, what he meant to the music world. First of all, I think if you just look at his biography and his story, he meant so much to the music world in terms of what is possible. I mean, here's a man who grew up in Manchuria uh, with his parents, his Japanese parents, and was moved back to Japan. Uh, I just came across this anecdote that I hadn't realized that he had wanted a piano and they moved it 50 miles to their home in in a push cart. I mean, he was just driven to, to play music, to understand music, and ultimately become one of the world's foremost most conductors. And then he comes to the United States because he rose up 
fairly, well, we say it always seems like it's an overnight success, but it wasn't. He rises up in Europe and then gets spotted and sent over here to the United States. Bernstein sees him, brings him to Tanglewood, and then his career just goes up and up and up. But this is very significant because you have a Japanese man who people at that time said that... uh, Asian people couldn't understand music. They might be able to play music. They might have technical prowess, yeah. exactly, but they couldn't really emotionally connect to it. Of course, he upended all of that. And then that changed both ways because here was a man who came from the East to the West who showed otherwise, but then in turn could bring this music, Western music, back to Eastern countries because it was this great exchange. He brought the BSO to China. It's just an amazing career. By the way, he speaks to some of the issues you're touching upon in a 2018 radio piece on GBH News, I should say, discussing the sa- this is Seijo Zawa himself, discussing the sacrifices he made to take the job at the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I am Japanese, I am Oriental, and uh, sometimes I said, why I become Western music musician? But I think that made my life much more interesting and much more exciting. Of course, I have to pay price. My main music work is in Boston. But my blood is Japanese, so my kids come from my blood is in Japan. So I have to divide in two. Was he the longest serving conductor? Yes. Of the, he was. Yeah. 29 years. You know yeah. what? I love this anecdote about how when he was a young man in his early 20s, he's studying at this music school in Tokyo, and then he takes a cargo ship to Europe, and this is in the New York Times piece too, bringing along with him a motor scooter and a guitar. I mean, what an incredible story. Then he goes on to win this competition in France that year, and uh, he goes on, he's spotted by Charles Munch, who was a big deal, the Boston Symphony Orchestra music director, formerly too. But what an incredible uh, story. And also, he immersed himself in popular culture. Who He was on the show, Who? What's My Line? What's My Line? Oh, and, I, yeah, I used to watch that as a kid. And then comes to Boston. <laughs> and at this time, the Boston Symphony Orchestra had a pretty meager endowment with his personality, again, with his artistic prowess for the way he built it. They it turned them into a giant. Uh, ultimately, he brought them into a point where they had the largest endowment of any orchestra in the world. I mean, he was such a force in every regard of his life that he changed, you can argue easily, that he changed music, especially here. Mark Volpe helped, I think, a little bit on the uh, financial (laughs) front in terms of the endowment. Did you ever meet him, by the way? I never met the first. I, I was thinking about this this morning. The first time I covered the BSO was the James Levine press conference oh, right. when oh. they finally named a new director. Oops. So yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, that didn't end well. So there's a. It was the story about Hunter Biden's art in quotes. Was that in the Wall Street Journal? This is a yes. spectacular yeah. it's a great story, story about his relationship. I don't know how to pronounce it. With George. Berger, is that um, how you say his name? Burgess. Burgess. Oh, okay. Yeah. George Burgess. <laughs> they put Who's, that little accent there. It looks fancier than you. it is. <laughs> Why is Jamie laughing at me? That's not very supportive, Jamie. Thank you. I'm doing my best, you know, under the circumstances. George Burgess. How, so tell us about George Burgess and Hunter uh, Biden and his art uh, work in quotes. Well, this is an interesting development because I remember going down the Hunter Biden art road in preparation for talking with you both about this a, a while ago. And when I looked at Hunter Biden, Art. I actually liked what I saw. I hadn't. I looked at everything online. I hadn't seen anything in person. He does have technical ability, and what I saw at the time, I liked. I'm not sure that I liked much of what I saw recently. However, this relationship between this gallerist George Burgess and Hunter Biden is now coming into. I think it's Burgess, by the way. But go ahead. <laughs> I, you know, I actually went on YouTube yesterday you did just to, to check make it sure, out because okay, I thought it okay. was too. <laughs> so now it's like the Penguin Meredith Burgess, so George <laughs> Burgess. But now it's come under question because it seems that. Some some of the people who are buying these paintings, and they are not inexpensive paintings. There are six figures. I think he sold a million and a half dollars worth of paintings just re- relatively recently. But some of them are people with political connections. At least one has received a presidential commission. But theoretically, totally unconnected to uh, yeah, the sure. uh, purchase of the painting. Totally love the art, not not loving having access to the administration. So yeah, this is all subject to investigation now and has completely tainted this gallerist. And, and he's saying one ha- doesn't have anything to do with the other, but it's all quite murky. My favorite part of the story, other than mispronouncing the guy's name, is he <laughs> mentions when he first met Hunter Biden, correct me, Marjorie, if I get some of this wrong, when he first meets him, they 
start a phone relationship. And he says he does not tell Hunter Biden that in the prior year he's made 20 contributions to the Trump campaign. <laughs> yes. That's a great opening That's to right. this uh, thing. Right. But then they become best buds. Is that not what, I mean, apparently really close these two, yes? A long-term friendship, yeah. yeah. You know what by I the way, I, and also, you know, everybody has a right to do whatever they want. And you shouldn't be encumbered by who your relatives are. However, and I feel the addiction thing and his recovery from it are all to be admired. Shouldn't be selling paintings when your father is the president of the United States. Well, he shouldn't have done a lot of things. Well, I mean, but, I mean, this, but this is like, I mean, are you not suspicious when someone buys a painting from an, a, a, a non-famous painter for 100 grand? Yes. When it turns out his father is president, I, that it's all about access? I'm very suspicious, but I, I, I think that Hunter Biden has, has a lot of problems in general. I mean, look at his life. It's kind of been a shambles, and this is just another stage of the, of the shambles. I think Joe Biden would tell him not to do a lot of things. I don't know if he's weighed in on his well, selling of the know, paintings you know, of or not, but I mean, my goodness. Well, I think there are any number of artists who are listening who can argue that this is not the trajectory of an artist, that suddenly you go from kind of dabbling in painting to having the, these kinds of commissions and having this kind of New York Soho representation. It just doesn't happen, you know, so clearly it's tied. You know what I was surprised at, though? Do, do, um, the, the commissions usually go 40%. Actually, I, mean, I was surprised because it's. I have typically understood it to be 50 50. Wow. 50 yes. 50. So yeah. Hunter got a better deal than most. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But From Berger. Like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> From Berger. 40% yeah. rather. Okay, enough Berger. of him. Okay. Okay, so we have a lot of great stuff. Most local, not all local to talk about. Uh, you should do it in the order you want. So I always feel if we don't get to one, as long as that's the one, the furthest down the road, we're fine. What do you want to start with? Well, I think a really big fun announcement that just came this week is that we get another pre-Broadway tryout here in Boston at the Emerson Colonial Theater. Uh, they just announced, they, they were in this uh, tradition recently, uh, David Burns' musical American Utopia started. One of the greatest yeah. things I've ever yeah, seen in a, my whole life. That was a blast. Life. I went to yeah. that You too. know what also was there is the great thing for a performer who I can't stand. What's uh, Sweet Caroline? What's his name? Neil, Neil Diamond. Diamond. A beautiful noise. That was one of the greatest yeah. things I've seen ever. I mean, absolutely ever, but it go ahead. It was very moving, and before that, Moulin Rouge. So we were yeah. in this period after the Emerson Colonial Theater reopened, and we knew that Ambassador Theater Group, which is running this theater, wanted to go back to this time where Boston would be a tryout town, just like New Haven was in Philadelphia, mm, your Philip beloved Philadelphia was. was. And uh, so it's starting again, so we're getting this musical this summer. It's called The Queen of Versailles. I don't know if you know anything about The Queen of Versailles. Oh, yeah. I do, yeah. actually. There was some, there yeah. was some Netflix thing about her, yeah. wasn't there? Something on TV about yeah, her. she and her, what was it, the timeshare king husband. Yeah. In were Florida, building, right? A yes. Florida deal. Awesome. Yeah. We're building their own version of Versailles, Versailles until yeah. the recession hit. <laughs> so now it's being turned into a musical starring Kristen Chenoweth. I love her, by the way. Also starring F. Murray Abraham. Whoa. Uh, or Abram. And uh, music written by Stephen Schwartz, who did Godspell, Pippin, and Wicked, which means wow. that Stephen Schwartz is being reunited with Kristen Chenoweth because she played Galinda in the original Wicked. When's that coming again? So this starts uh, July 16th uh, and runs through August 18th. And the, the joyous thing about this is this, the, this is the time where audience, anybody who goes in this time period is having access to theater history because every single night they are watching the audience. They see what works, what doesn't yeah. work. They go back in the middle of the night. They rewrite songs for true? the next day's that's show. That's true, really? Absolutely. That's, oh, that's the pre-Broadway yeah. whole shtick, right? Is, is, to, exactly right? is to get the show to a better place before it actually debuts yep. on, on Broadway. Yes, so, so it might it be very different what you see on Broadway. Well, not very, but I'm sure. No, sometimes it can be very different. Very different. They may eliminate songs or yep. add songs or that kind of thing. Yeah, it's really kind of it's kind of neat. I forget there was one there was one musical. For, we, I always think of you, Marjorie, with uh, Elliot Norton. The oh my Herald gosh, I had colleague. his typewriter. <laughs> but he made an observation about one show. I wish I could remember off the top of my head, but he made an observation about one show that they should bring back this character to have a bigger role. And sure enough. Whatever, oh, this is driving me crazy. Maybe Jamie can find it. I don't know. Um, but whatever show it was, this character ended up having a full fledged role by the time it went to New York. Oh, so critics good. have a say, audiences have a say by their response. It's really fun. Okay, before we move to the next topic, what's, what's with a wolf? Oh, it's, it's the logo for my, for my I mean, sweatshirt. It's a little, it's a little, what do you think of that, Marjorie? 
I think it's extremely attractive. You do? Yes, oh, I do. I mean, Dara dresses extremely well. I wouldn't talk. I don't if think I it's were working you. for you. Oh, I mean, I, I'm being as nice as I can, oh. but I just doesn't. I don't think. When it's... I was a kid, we had a little Shibu, Shiba Inu uh, dog. A what? A Shiba Inu what dog, and they're, they're actually kind of look like a fox, which this is. Yeah. So it reminds me of my. Our, sort our of looks dog. like a stick on. Does that not look? <laughs> look like a stick on to you? Tell the truth, Marjorie. Be nice. Stick well, on. it does have a little sticker quality. Stick it, like a stick quality, on it. Like oh. But other than that, it's really nice. looks great on you. We're talking <laughs> yes. to, uh, to uh, Jared Bowen. But it's Bone. a very cute Can we do uh, machine animal. learning first because it's near yeah. me and dog. it sounds fabulous? Yeah. Shiba okay. Inu, that's a great looking dog. Oh, it is we a have a picture dog. of it. You can't see it. We have a picture yeah. on our screen. And they're little love bugs, too. Little love bugs. By the way, we have stick ons of that, too. If you email us at uh, GBH, we'll be sending Where are you going next? Where are we going next? We're going to Central Square Theater, I think. Are we not? This is a world premiere piece. It's called Machine Learning. It's also presented by Tao. Chelsea and uh, in collaboration with the Catalyst Collaborative at MIT, which makes sense because this is a show somewhat about AI. And we find this computer scientist, Jorge, and he is looking back at his memories and his relationship with his father. Who has who is an alcoholic? By the time we meet him in this play, we go. It's a bit of a memory play too. So we work backward in time to understand this fraught relationship they have. In the present time, his father is sick with cancer, so he writes this machine program so that there can be machine learning, so that it can respond and essentially be a nurse to his father. And. So this isn't necessarily completely a show about AI, although it is, and the way it's staged, I have to say, is very, very interesting because the computer is voiced, the computer named Arnold, after Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator, Ooh. is uh, is voiced, and we see him manifested by these animations on the, the back screen, the backdrop in this theater, and so are these hazy memories, as Jorge is recalling his relationship with his father. Uh, but in developing this machine learning, he's also kind of learning how to relate to his father and what it means to step back, what it means to step forward into the relationship, and what it means to be an adult evaluating this relationship. And it becomes quite moving, especially as we're in this moment of reconciling where we're headed, where software or where um, yeah, algorithms are going to define so much of our lives and how we live and how we relate to one another. How soon till we're tired of AI-themed uh, art, do you think? Oh, I don't mean creative never art, but happen. really? No, I, I, it just keeps tumbling forward every day. We're learning more and more about what it's doing and how I think it's going to govern our lives. You know, were you talking in the Culture Show today about this piece the Globe had about the struggle in the arts community and the, in the theater community for to getting the seats. audiences in to fill yeah. seats? Um, are you discussing that at all? Because I want I wonder what you think, what you thought of that piece. We're not discussing that per se, because I think we've we've talked it in different iterations over the last few months, but it, it, it's concerning. This is yeah. this is troubling. But the, just like the world cracked open with COVID, behaviors cracked open, and and people got so much more complacent. I think in being at home and watching theater that way, people are also not returning to the movie theaters. Movie theater attendance is really down. Uh, television got really good, so there was every reason to stay home. Now it's easier to have movies come into your home. They come out into the theaters, and have, just a couple of weeks later, there you can stream them on Apple or whatever. And so people, I think, became less motivated to get out into the theater. And theater audiences are also older, so there was a comfort level problem here. Are you going to get sick if you go to the theater? Of course, theaters have done everything they can to make it as safe as possible, but attendance is down. We've already seen a couple of performing arts organizations, New Rep in Watertown and... and yes. um, Improv Boston and Cambridge, speaking of Central Square, close. So, uh, and as people have predicted, because of the federal funding drying up, we're going to see more economic impact and possibly more closures. Uh, and I, this isn't a plug for the culture show, but this is why I think this is a perfect time for this show. To, uh, my goal is to help reacquaint people with something they know they love, which is theater and arts. And, I would call that a plug for the culture show. Well, it probably is, but motivate people to, to get out and, and hopefully participate do you ever, again. Do you ever talk to performers about how hard it is, if it is, to perform when there are only half the seats? I've told you both the story. When yeah. I was living in Provincetown 400 years ago, they opened a new theater for music performances, and a very, very, very famous blues guitarist, whose name I can't remember, I know, Jim, you shouldn't bring it up if you don't know who you're talking about, was pretty famous, came to town to play. Uh, 
I had two business partners at the time in my store. The three of us were the only people yeah. in the theater. This oh guy, I told you a story. This guy comes out. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. He comes out on the stage. He doesn't acknowledge that there are only three of us there. In the utmost professional way, he plays his whole set. As it, no, it was brilliant. I'm not, I'm not mocking him. I'm no, praising I'm, him. I'm it was incredible. Brave. Such a professional. Yeah. But at the same time, as I'm sitting there, I'm saying to him, how does he feel? playing in the three of us. How do actors feel when they're doing something that matters to them a lot and they're 57% of the seats are empty. You've just made me realize I have never asked that question. I will take that I, opportunity I would. the next time. You do that as a promo for the culture show. Well, Go ahead. What? We know that every actor tells me they feel the that temperature, the energy of the room. They 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 feed off of that. That's why we love theater. It's that living, breathing space, that, that exchange. And, of course, the dynamic is different. I promise I will ask and I will report back. Oh, look at what Jamie just reported. It was what is it? Elliot Norton critiqued. The Odd Couple. That's right. About lack of character. His review of the Neil play, Simon's Neil Simon, Odd Couple changed. Yep, he said it was enthusiastically positive, but complained about Norton did complained about the play's dull <laughs> ending. <laughs> that is great. On his television show, he remarked to Mr. Simon that he'd missed the Pigeon Sisters in the third act. So they brought the. That's right. So they brought the Pigeon Thank Sisters. Thank you, Ethan. Or, by the way, appreciate uh, it. back into the show and, and beefed up that part. That's wow. incredible. All right, we only have time for one more thing. So tell us the thing that's going to disappear most quickly so we'll get to the next thing next week. What is uh, it? Well, we should talk about, oh, you know what's closing soon? And I, I learned more about this because we first talked about it here is the Keith Herring unfinished Oh, painting. we did talk. Go, oh, yeah, go yes. ahead. Do tell that. us about that. So we talked about that. And a few weeks later, I found myself in Toronto and I went to the Art Gallery of Ontario there and they have this exhibition called Heath. Keith Haring, Art is for Everybody. And we were talking about the unfinished painting that somebody used AI to finish. And it was just a horrible, horrible circumstance because this was a painting that Keith Haring did late in his life, only painted the upper left-hand corner. You see drips of paint. He ne never was able to return to it because he died of AIDS-related illness. Uh, he's somebody who worked for this period just about 10 years, doing as much as he possibly could. That's the heart of this show, to understand that this is a man who knew he was probably going to die as a gay man in New York in the uh, he arrived in New York in the late 70s painting trains and subway murals before the art world took hold of him uh, so he had 10 years to make a difference and what a difference he made we see how he made monumental murals and he painted on urns and columns and he developed his own vocabulary with his lines if, if you look up Keith Haring if you don't know him already he painted people and dogs and lots of penises actually uh, but he's somebody who just kept going and going and going he had this great partnership with uh, I think Grace Jones and Madonna painted yeah. Madonna's skirts yeah. they partied together so this is a really fabulous show if you happen to be in Toronto. If you don't happen to be in Toronto, it's just a, a great lesson in how artists see themselves, especially when they know that time is short. Why were you in The Wolf in Toronto, if I may ask? What were you doing there? I was there for a wedding. Oh, you were? How was that? Not mine. How was that? It was fun. Really? They yeah. have a great little anecdote in the story talking about how Madonna first performed like a virgin at his birthday party and the, yeah. before she became famous. And um, they had That's a, pretty amazing. And, and as you mentioned... Did you mention Dolly Parton? I think you did. Yeah, yeah Dolly, Dolly Parton, Parton was, Andy a, was a friend. Yeah, he, he cut a wide swath. As Jared hangs out with Dolly Parton. You know. <laughs> did you <laughs> hang out with her? Well, I you did. had a great interview on your out. television show with her. That was so wonderful. I love her. So, She's yeah. just the best. I'll tell her that the next time I'm <laughs> talking to her. <laughs> okay, you know please. what they had at this wedding that I went to? No. The, apparently this is a new trend. A tattoo artist. No, like at permanent the, tattoos? The, permanent did you tattoo. get one? I, for a second, I thought about it. Do you know really? I actually did? And then the, the the person in front of me was getting a tattoo of a small milk carton. And I thought, I'm probably not making <laughs> the, a few drinks into this reception. I'm, I might not be making the best choices. But that's, they had a tattoo artist. That's could have gotten a, wolf. a problem. I could have gotten, I probably would have <laughs> actually. <laughs> but I thought it was so much fun. A lot of people would be several drinks into the reception and then make a bad choice. Yeah. Wow. I wonder who that might be. Uh, I, I wouldn't know, but okay. I could see where it, you could get in trouble with that kind oh. of situation. It's like the soldiers, right, on on home leave when they're all having <laughs> you know 19 beers and they decide to get all these tattoos they later regret. So what's in the culture show? Uh, we are going to be talking about Seiji Ozawa, but we're also going to be talking about uh, the possible return of the Parthenon marbles that have marbles. My yeah. Boston accent just slipped out. 
out there. <laughs> um, they, they've been in the British Museum for 200 years, and Greece has been asking them for, for them back for a long time, and we may be the closest we've ever been to seeing those returns. So Is this we'll one of these provenance, provenance kind of things? or they well, it's, it's more than that. There's been this huge, long, long dispute about how they were gotten, but then oh. how where are they safest? Oh, here or there. But wait a second. But this, isn't this? So we just discussed this in another context. Isn't the excuse for those museums who aren't getting with the program in 2024 always they're not safe back in their native country? That's the BS excuse they use all the time, right? Yeah. So for a long time, people argue that 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 sailed in Greece, but that doesn't really fly anymore. Mm. All right. Well, all I can say to you is woof is. Uh, <laughs> If I may, I don't think that that wolves. Woof. What do they do? Whatever they, they do, growl. that's what I meant. They make those weird noises in the night when they're killing things. They screech. Yeah. I've that? seen live wolves, by the way. Have you seen live wolves like in the wild kind of thing? These beautiful little red things no. and whatever. I've seen coyotes. Yeah. Well, they're similar. I know. Sue, Sue O'Connell just ran by. <laughs> she did. Chased. With a wolf chasing her, actually, <laughs> right down Market them. Street. The whole pack is going after her. Okay, Jared. The street. We'll be listening at 2 thank o'clock. Great to see you. Thanks so much. Her dog. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Jared Bowen. We've been speaking with Jared Bowen, GBH News Executive Arts Editor and host of The Culture Show, which airs daily at 2 o'clock. That would be right after we're done on 89.7. GBH, thank you very much, Jared Bowen. Uh, coming up after a quick break, we're going to talk with Boston Globe columnist Marcella Garcia. She's going to talk about a lot of things, including why is it that the migrants in Massachusetts go to Roxbury instead of perhaps Wellesley? We'll ask Marcella about that. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are not at the Boston Public Library today. We apologize, but we are streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. There's an African proverb that says, until the lion tells the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. As GBH News celebrates Black History Month, we pass the mic to the lion. Did you know that the Twa people, derogatively referred to in modern times as pygmies, are the first human beings? We owe the birth of humanity to the Twa. In ancient African societies, they were revered and even worshipped. Support for GBH comes from you. And Showcase Cinemas. On February 11th, you can see a screening of Malcolm X, followed by a Q&A with historian Dr. Carrie Greenidge, in partnership with the Museum of African American History, showcasecinemas.com. And Q Legal, providing legal marketing solutions for law firms in Boston and beyond. Marketing strategies include websites, social media, video, and search. You can learn more about their services at qlegal.com. Trusted. Local. News. You're listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. We're live at GBH's Fraser Studio, not the library. We have technical issues. We assume they're all going to be fixed by Tuesday. And in which case, we'll be back at the library with Mayor Wu from 11 to 12. You can watch us streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. And the reason you should is not because of me and Marjorie. In the one o'clock hour, we're going to have uh, both Irene Lee from May May uh, Dumplings, not only bringing dumplings, which is pretty important to me and Marjorie, but Mai Du from Walam Kung Fu and Tai Chi has, what would it look like, 20 young kids? Oh my gosh. Who are going to do a lion it's dance in honor of Lunar I'm New so Year. I'm so excited. It is really, they rehearsed a little bit during the noon break and it was just, just great. We're joined now on Zoom by Boston Globe columnist Marcella Garcia. She's also an editorial board member there, the woman behind the Globe's bilingual Latin. Next newsletter, Mira, and a TikTok influencer, along with their two adorable dogs, Santo and Benito. Marcel, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having me We're today. We're thrilled to have well, you. Well, you know, Marcella, thank you so much for bringing to our attention, readers of the Boston Globe, this absolutely incredibly disturbing story about this young man who uh, got into a confrontation with police in Florida. Tell us what happened. This is one of the most horrific cases that I've ever written about. It is so heart-wrenching. Basically, last May in Florida, as you note, the, there was this young migrant from Guatemala who doesn't speak English, speaks a Mayan language as a native language, speaks a little bit of Spanish, obviously, 
but he he was waiting outside of a motel one evening in May. He was staying at that motel with fellow farm workers. He works as a farm worker. And he was sitting outside minding his own business when a patrol car approached him. And the uh, police officer basically just asked him, uh, what are you doing here? Started questioning him. The young man did not really understand what was going on. Next thing you know, the police encounter, you probably can guess what happened, escalates. And again, next thing you know, two, two other police cars showed up. The young man is being tasered. Uh, tragically, after, I mean, this, is, this confrontation probably lasted a few minutes. It's all captured on video, on, on a body camera, by the way. But tragically, after this young man had been tasered, subdued, basically put on, on a chokehold, handcuff taking away the the original police officer who stopped him died of a heart attack and the really really horrific thing um i mean obviously a, a, you know a, a death of a police officer is always tragic right but this young man was charged with the murder of the death of this of this police officer which by the way had been determined by a medical examiner to be uh, natural cause, uh, natural death. It was a yeah. natural death. The guy suffered a heart attack. And yet this guy was, um, this young man from Guatemala was charged with murder. The charges were later downgraded to aggravated manslaughter. He's still in jail. I actually, and so I wrote about the case because obviously his he's, he's, um, defense team, his criminal defense team, he was assigned a um, a um a public defender, they they filed to obtain the uh, body camera footage, and it really is horrific to watch how they subdue it and how they wrestle this young man, who in all likelihood was probably was probably being racially profiled. For this reason, one of the lawyers is is planning on file a civil rights suit because he's contending that these young men's uh, rights uh, were violated. And but then there's also the criminal case, correct? Um, and yes. I just found out actually today that um, from the lawyer from the civil case, um, the, the lawyer who who takes who has the civil uh, case, there was a um, an update, and the update is that he this guy, the young man, has a new legal team. The um, high-profile criminal defense attorney Jose Bias. I don't know if you guys remember. Oh, of course yes. we do yes, from yes, the Hernandez yes. case. Correct. Casey Anthony, and he defended, let you oh, say, Anthony, uh, Jim. Right. Yeah, Heron Hernandez in the double murder trial. And he's going to join, um, he's wow. going to be lead criminal defense counsel of, of this young man, Virgilio Aguilar Mendez, pro bono. Obviously, he's he's being, um, he's joining pro bono. So, so that's good news. I'm told he's in great spirits, but he's been in jail for more than 10 months, 11, eight, nine months, and it's such a horrific case. I... I'm not one of those people who who tends to watch body camera videos of these case, police encounters. Obviously, I watched this one, and I can tell you that I will never forget that video. I will never, never. It, his cries, his uh, it's just so so horrible. I've actually gotten a lot of feedback from this column, obviously because people recognize what a great injustice this is, right? And and uh, I, I got an email from a reader just recently, like last week or so and this person was like i know you wrote about this uh three weeks ago but i cannot stop thinking about this young man please stay on top of it and then i do plan to stay on top of it uh what i'm told is that there have been um motions filed to free virgilio from detention there's been another motion filed to have the charges dismissed but right now it's sort it's it's still sort of at a standstill the case uh, there's a change.org petition. Yeah, I don't so know. That. People may people may think that that makes an impact uh, or not, but I, I think it's just so frustrating and so horrific to to learn about this. And again, I am not encouraging anyone to 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 well, watch this video. But his parents, right? Mm -hmm. They couldn't they couldn't even bear to watch it. I mean, can you imagine the oh, mother and father? Yeah. But you know what I wonder, Marcella, whose idea was this to charge someone who was subdued so brutally by the cops to charge him? An ambitious prosecutor who probably wants to cozy up to Ron DeSantis. Yeah. Or well, something. I don't know. Correct. Is, is that correct? It? It's all political. It's all. Pol I mean, I was told it was it was sort of a political uh, charge prosecution it's um you know that area is uh, this is in john's county 
it's pretty conservative, pretty Republican. And I think the ch- the sheriff's office, um, you know, was just very ambitious, like Jim said, and, and aggressive. And and I think even the, the the press conference, there was a press conference to announce the charges, but and obviously the death of the police officer. And you can imagine, and, and in that press conference, they made it sound like Virgilio, this young man, was was being aggressive and that he it's just it, it, it that video is all obviously also I, I don't think i i linked to it but it's it's available and they made it sound like this guy was was wanted for murder all right you know yeah. like he and, and so he was carrying a pocket knife virgilio and i think they're using that fact to sort of justify everything in reality that that pocket knife he was carrying because of his work, he and in the video you can hear him saying Spanish para sandia, like for watermelon, because that's what he did as a farm worker. He was cutting watermelon, and that's why he was carrying that knife. There was basically no reasonable suspicion for you know, just obviously the the police officer is dead. But what he was able to broadcast over the radio is that he saw a suspicious male. Hispanic, uh, Hispanic suspicious male, and that's why he stopped him. But no other reason was given. By the way, it, it's terrific you highlighted this because I, I should say I was not aware of this. And when I, I never heard searched of it, it I this read morning, Marcella's virtually column. every story, with the exception of an AP story and yours, uh, pardon me, an ABC story and yours, is in mm-hmm. Florida, meaning it has not reached beyond the borders of the state for the most part. And thanks to you, it will. We're talking to Marcella Garcia from the uh, Boston Globe. You know, there's some, your headline says some good news for her children, and the rest of the headline could have been amidst horrible news that the children have to live with. Reina Carolina Morales Rojas, you've been writing about, that's the East Boston woman, has been missing for more than a year. Her kids are able to make use of a law uh, and something called a U visa, which I'm also embarrassed to say I'd never heard of, which will lead to a better life, even though they don't have their mother, which maybe right. probably is their first concern. What exactly is a U visa and what's happening to these kids? Yeah, not a lot of people know about the availability of this visa program. And like you say, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty sort of, it's not obscure, but it was created to basically foster cooperation between law enforcement and victims particularly disenfranchised victims who of, the, of uh, yeah, any sort of criminal case or, or a crime that may not have trust in the police and they may, may not be willing to come forward because maybe their their, their legal status is mm-hmm. it's not either they're undocumented etc but but this this again this U visa is now going to be extended or or, or the 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 kids of Reina Carolina Morales Rojas, the woman uh, from East Boston, originally from El Salvador, lived in East Boston at the time, has been missing for more than a year now, 25, 24 months. I'm sorry, not 25. Um, 14. Oh, my God, my math, 14, sorry, yeah, <laughs> 14 okay. months. Uh, and it, it, this this was basically an opportunity for me to obviously talk about the U visa, but also to shed light on, like you said, a positive sort of uh, bright spot, I guess, in, in an otherwise horrific case of a missing woman here here in Boston. And again, the U visa, uh, it's it's a long process. I mean, the, it, it's hard to find a visa process that is not long or that is not plagued by delays right now in our current immigration system. But the visa, the, the U visa, they, they get adjudicated for years. Like these kids obviously are going to be waiting for years for this visa, but, but they're teenagers. And by the time they probably get it, I'm told uh, by the legal advocates that are involved in this case, lawyers for civil rights, I'm told that they're going to try to expedite, file for an expedited process. I'm not really sure what that means, if, if it's going to be two years, three years, whatever. But but what they really want, Jim and Marjorie, is to come here and to advocate for the mom because they seem to think that if they're here, they can go to the police totally office, the, the police station and, and go and, and basically be there every day. Right? And, and also... They want to, you know, they want to basically, uh, you know, th- their mom came here to give them, a, obviously, to to give them a better future, mm-hmm. among other things. But they want, she wanted them to go to college. And, and here they probably have a better chance of, of achieving that. Again, it's in the long term, but but it's a great, it's a great program. Um, and, and I I actually, I, I, I give praise or I give credit to the Office of DA Marion Ryan, Middlesex uh, District Attorney Marion Ryan, because it really is up to a law enforcement agency. Because for this U visa, 
when you apply, I mean, not not anybody, it's not like everybody can apply mm -hmm. if you're a victim. You have to have, as part of your application, a certification from a law enforcement, from a qualifying law enforcement agency. In this case, that would be, that, that's Middlesex District Attorney, Attorney's Office. And I'm told by them, this didn't make it to this, to, to my column, but they, they've been certifying you visas in the last few years. Um, increasingly. So in 2023, they certified 90 U visas uh, for 90 different people, and they're available for victims of crimes and for immediate family members of victims of, of certain crimes, not every crime, but I mean, some, you know, major crimes. So it's it was an opportunity for me to obviously elevate this this program. And, and again, it serves various purposes, right? It, yeah. it fosters collaboration between law enforcement and, and victims. And, and again, uh, the other thing too is that I've always seen the um, the children of Reina Carolinas as victims as well. His family, right? Like we course. don't know what happened to her, but they're they're also victims. We're talking to Marcella Garcia from the Boston Globe. You know, Marcella, uh, Mayor Wu um, she has expressed she's not quite thrilled with Governor Maura Healy's idea to convert the Melnia Cast Recreational Complex in Roxbury into uh, a place where um, migrant families can live, up to 100 homeless families, including uh, migrants. And you <laughs> did a call about this and talked about some of the signs that were uh, held up in a protest about this called one of them was why Roxbury try Wellesley and I got kind of a kick about that now I've learned that the Globe has just reported following up on your column no doubt that it's wealthier mass communities that avoid the brunt of expanding uh, a shelter crisis uh, of 94 communities hosting emergency shelters shelters more than half of a median household income below a hundred grand while just nine of those communities and that includes Acton, Concord, and Lexington have household incomes mm. above a fifty grand. So I think your the question you 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 quoted in your in your column why Wellesley is a good question. Why yeah, not? I absolutely absolutely no. Not every community has bear the burden of uh, or, or hasn't really welcomed migrants in shelters or, or offer space in their communities for shelters the same way. And and I think I the the, the I guess I, I wrote this column because I had been hearing kind of a background of the record type of thing from nonprofit leaders in, in the city of Boston who had been complaining that Boston hadn't been doing enough to to offer shelter space. And, 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 and the rumor, or I guess the theory went that this is why Governor Healy, like you mentioned, Marjorie, had to use the Melnia Cass Recreation Center, which is a state property, because Essentially, Boston hadn't been the city of Boston had been as forthcoming, and and but I I spoke with Mayor Wu who defended her city's response. She mentioned a few other properties that the city and the state officials had evaluated for shelter space, no avail, including the West Roxbury Educational Center, which has been empty. And but but to to the larger point about why not Wellesley, why not Newton? It's a fair one. It's absolutely a fair one. After I wrote my column, I, I a reader from Wellesley contacted me, and I may I may actually follow up on this because he said in Wellesley we just built a huge recreation center, and it is empty most of the time. He says that the population of Wellesley is approximately thirty thousand. The population of Roxbury is approximately sixty thousand. And again, this is a fair point that maybe. Yeah, you know, maybe the need in 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 Roxbury for a center for themselves is perhaps higher than in Wellesley because according to this person who wrote to me, this reader, it's not it's empty most of the time, and so it is a fair question. What about Wellesley? Right? Another another point that somebody else made. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the site uh, Contrarian Boston, and so the, uh, Say they that wrote again, about which, which, this is Scott, your former Scott Van Voorhees. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. He's yeah. terrific. Yeah. yeah. He's working at the so Scott Van Voorhees yeah. wrote this this week about, he raised another point about what about the former Mount Ida College uh, dormitories in in Newton? That's a great you know how, point. Right? Yep, like, yep, you know, yep, U.S. Yep. Amherst bought Mount Ida College a few years ago, five years ago, and they have a 74-acre campus. It's gorgeous. And I, a, a, apparently, according to Contrarian Boston, a few of the dormitories are kind of empty or they, they're shuttered buildings. So meaning that there's space there that could be used. And I'm sure there's so many other properties all over the state, especially in wealthy communities, where where just there's just not the political will. People don't 
don't want to bother with this. Uh, but but the need is there. I mean, I I'm I'm telling you, like people are coming in and they have nowhere to stay. I was just reading about in another local site in Brookline News about a local family who decided to open their their home to a family from Haiti. And and those efforts are are, are laudable, right? But they're not sustainable. Like you can open, you cannot ask a hundred or two hundred or a thousand people in Massachusetts to open their homes. Plus, there's so many risks associated with asking private citizens, right? To like, how are you going to vet them, right? And yeah. and so it, it, it's just a matter of political will. I think I think if there there was more effort in in these communities. I feel like they, they 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 see maybe that you know out of sight out of mind. It, this is not my issue. This is not my problem. Is being dealt with. But the moment that you open up the Wellesley Recreation Center to to migrants, I'm telling. I I just wonder what would happen. I wonder what people would say if if they would be welcoming in Wellesley. You would think that they might, but maybe not. I don't think you have to worry about ever having that discussion, Marcella. So I think <laughs> you can spare I want to have that discussion. I know you do. We're talking to Marcella Garcia from the Boston Globe. There is such little good news on guns, uh, and you actually have some. Uh, talk yeah. to us about uh, this litigation from Mexico, actually, against U.S. Uh, uh, gun makers. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, it's this is this obviously stemmed from the from our, our very, very uh, nonsensical laws around gun, guns and, and, and liability particularly. As you, as you probably know, it's been very hard for victims of mass shootings or, or just shootings in general, um, massacres, gun massacres, to bring accountability or to bring uh, the gun makers into account for for the product that they they manufacture right because they, there's a, there's this law that basically grants them why immunity um, right immunity yeah. immunity and so so this this is actually a really a really innovative uh way of getting around that law what what basically mexico you know the the government of mexico decided to file a lawsuit a, a couple of years ago against the gun makers in arguing that that law does not apply to the government of Mexico, to a, basically a foreign government. And the, the sort of standing or, or the argument is that most of the guns, obviously, as you know, Mexico is plagued by drug cartel violence, shootings, there's mass disappearances, mass shootings, you know, it's, you name it, the violence is insane. And this is really, really interesting because Mexico has strict gun control laws like you cannot really buy a gun there unless you go through a lot a lot of you know you, you jump through a lot of hoops but there's a there's an incredible av availability of guns but it's because they're coming from here yeah. and they're being trafficked into Mexico and there's a lot of data that supports this as evidence our government here in the US has definitely uh, has documented this flow of guns south and so that's what Mexico is saying you're responsible for for the death and, and the violence that your product is causing. You're putting them in the hands of drug cartels. They argue that that gun manufacturers could be doing a lot more to prevent gun trafficking uh, into, you know, south of the border, and they haven't been doing it. Now, this lawsuit, obviously, because it was a little unprecedented and innovative, has been challenged. Uh, and so th what happened was that there was a, a legal victory in the case that allowed the case to continue because there was a court, an appeals court, that said that Mexico could, in fact, sue the gun manufacturers. I'm sure they are going to also appeal the gun manufacturers, but for now, it's it's ongoing. And and again, it, it is reflective of of what people have to do to to bring accountability. It, when when there's been mass shootings or or um, gun violence and and there's other cases there's another case at least one other case that was brought by one of the victims of the Parkland high school uh, shooting in in Florida and um, they, they're they're basically suing in an international court as well and so it, it is I guess indicative of we have what we have to do to bring some form of accountability and to hold this gun manufacturer responsible because there has been barely any. You know, Marcella, before you go, I, I'm curious that you wrote a piece about the progress that the Biden administration has made on the legal immigration front, which we don't spend much time on. There was a lot of conflict in the minds of people who think we need more humane immigration laws around this failed bipartisan effort championed by Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Some thought it was the best 
that one can get under the circumstances because elections have consequences and the Republicans do control the House of Representatives. So get something, even though there's not much for people who believe in making better lives for dreamers, et cetera. And there are others. And I think Yvonne Abraham wrote a piece, one of your colleagues wrote a piece, saying what a disaster this was and what a sellout it was for those who uh, contend that they feel empathy for people uh, escaping violence and, and mm -hmm. financial ruin. Where did you fall on this legislation that failed the other day? Well, I, I think I, I, I saw a piece with, with a terrific headline, you know, file under pieces that I wish I had written, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a piece in the New York Times that said this, this immigration effort never really stood a chance. And, and I think that's where I, where I fall because I think it was always set up for failure from the moment that Biden sort of agreed in October, back in October, back in September, when when he was talking to congressional leaders about about requesting supplemental foreign aid to Ukraine, to Taiwan, to Israel. They, the you know, Republicans said we're never going to do this unless you also include border policy right. reforms. So they did. And he agreed to that. Yeah. He agreed. Biden agreed. And so that marriage of these two, like that set it up for failure, right? Number one. Number two, I mean, the Biden administration really has done good reforms on, on, on immigration. I mean, we have to sort of differentiate here or this, there's a distinction, right? Border versus immigration, right? The border, border control is one thing, but immigration policy is like, how are you letting in people, right? Like all these people who are coming to, you know, to Roxbury, right? And, and, and into, into our state and, and other, other major metros in, in the country are having the same, the same problems. How do we deal with this influx, right? Like, they're letting them in. They're they're being let in to apply for asylum, et cetera, in, in, in other you know humanitarian parole, other tools that the Biden administration is using. I think that's good. But the problem is you are also not alleviating or not allowing these people, these newly arrived, to immediately work, and that creates the strain on local and state governments. What's well, so the problem here, the, isn't it? I mean, that's what we're suffering exactly, through: is they exactly. can't work and get out exactly. of the shelters, so, right? Exactly. And so, if you don't give them an opportunity to work. You're not giving them an opportunity to get on their feet quickly to get housing, et cetera, and which is obviously another problem in our in our state, right? Housing or lack of housing, and so so the, the, it, in a way, a lot of people say, you know, why are you letting them in by the, to the Biden administration if you are not giving them the tools to to succeed here? Number one and number two, you're basically passing the buck or, or making it the local or the state government's problem. And so, you know, again, it, it is it is a very complex issue, but I don't think that it ever, ever stood a chance of passing this deal because it, it was now the, the the dynamics have become really interesting. You know, now you have Trump saying don't pass anything, right? Basically saying the quiet thing out loud, which is we want to have this problem because it helps us during the presidential election. It's going to help me, right? Beat Biden is basically what Trump is saying. And so, the you know, Republicans are basically agreeing to that, which is so awful and, and, and hypocritical. And and ultimately, I mean, I hope they pay a price at the polls in, in November. Time will tell. There's still a long, uh, you know, a long, uh, long way to go there. A lot of things can happen. But but I again, to your original question, I don't think it ever stood a chance. It was just this, this you know, dance that that it never really was going to lead anywhere. Marcella Marcel, Garcia, it's great yeah, to talk to you as thank always. Thank you very really much for your it. great columns, Marcella. Appreciate your time. Thank you guys for having me. No dogs this time, but next time I promise I will write <laughs> yeah, about dogs. That's right. So. We miss the dog. I will. Don't worry. I promise. Thank you Say so hi much. For us. We've been speaking with Boston Globe columnist uh, Marcella Garcia. She's also an editorial board member of The Globe and the woman behind The Globe's bilingual Latinx newsletter, Mira. Okay, after a quick break, James Beard award-winning Irene Lee and Lion Dance, martial art and Tai Chi instructor Mai Du join us for food, music, and lion dancing. They're next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. If you're not already watching us on YouTube.com slash GBH News and Facebook.com com slash GBH news this would be the time to start
I'm Craig Lamolt in for Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, the Boston Symphony Orchestra's iconic former conductor Seiji Ozawa has died at age 88. State officials are considering a new temporary shelter site in Fort Point. And Lunar New Year starts this weekend. We'll hear how locals are celebrating. Those stories in all the day's news starting at 4 on GBH's All Things Considered. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Vermont Law and Graduate School, offering JD and master's degree programs in environmental law and policy and restorative justice. Online and residential programs available. VermontLaw.edu. And the Cambridge Homes, a nonprofit, independent, and assisted living community in Cambridge, offering residents supportive services as well as cultural, educational, and social programs. The Cambridge slash tradition. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. She's Marjorie. And we're live at the Fraser Studio, the beautiful Fraser Studio, I should say, at GBH on Guest Street. We're not at the library because of some technical problems. They should be fixed by Tuesday, assuming they are. Mayor Wu will join us from 11 to 12 on Tuesday for Ask the Mayor. And we've said this repeatedly. For the next few minutes, if you are not watching on youtube.com slash gbh news and facebook.com slash gbh news you're really gonna miss out trust me because they're joined now by james beard award-winning chef restaurateur cookbook author irene lee of mimi dumplings and my do founder and chief instructor at walam kung fu and tai chi academy as well as the co-founder and vice president of the united dragon and lion dance federation they're hosting an events for lunar new year tomorrow at mimi dumplings in south boston for information and book tickets you can go to mimi mei mei dumplings Com. And by the way, I should say, even though it's not the topic today, these are two of the most relentless and important social justice activists in our community. <laughs> you really are. And we really, we thank you for your work, your food, your dancing. Irene and Maya, it's great to see you both. Thanks for being yeah, here. Yeah, thank you so much for coming in. And thanks for everybody who's coming. who's going to dance for just a couple of seconds. So explain, Irene, for people who don't know, what's the Lunar New Year? The Lunar New Year is probably the biggest celebration in many Asian cultures. And in my house growing up, Lunar New Year was, of course, all about dumplings. Big surprise. <laughs> but um, it's so, sort of, so she says, anyway. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you'll have to get my mom in here to fact check that. But at May May tomorrow, we, we are sold out, unfortunately. But we are going to have oh. these incredible dancers, noodle pulling, dumpling making, um, lantern crafting. We really want to get everyone excited about this holiday, which in many parts of the country, the celebration and the world rather the celebration lasts for weeks um, so any excuse to uh, to party and eat dumplings in the depths of February <laughs> how many lion dance performances are you doing uh, over the next couple of days my uh, more than 10 but within the three weeks we're booked for more than 60 more than oh 60 my oh my god so, so I assume people, yeah. right everybody is, I hope everybody has seen a lion dance either in Chinatown have you in person I don't think so oh my god so are you here in we are we're going to see it in a minute explain what it is and explain who these wonderful kids are so the lion dance has its um, roots with the mythic um, story of the lions being sacred and then invited from the mountains to come and bless a community uh, where when it comes down and dance, it has this magic from the third eye, which is the sixth chakra, and it's going to drive away all evil energy, bad, toxic uh, buildup and stagnation and just clear out everything, bring in good energy, auspicious, good health, successes, um, prosperity. blessings, prosperity, <laughs> and uh, longevity. So we always see the lion dance at every celebratory event, uh, particularly Lunar New Year celebration. Okay. So and who are the kids? Tell we're going to little... feel much better at the end of the we lion are. dance than we are now. Then, so right? definitely. Tell us okay. a little bit about who these kids or young people are who are performing both on the drums, the dance, the whatever. Who are these people? We're incredibly excited. So we have members of the Walam Kung Fu and Tai Chi Academy performance troupe here. Our youngest member here is seven years old and she started at the age of four. That's and our right. oldest are our college students now and they started at three. And they are just excited to be here. Some of them have taken the day off to celebrate Lunar New Year and Aww. others have learned about this opportunity to be with the Jim and Marjorie show, Boston Public Larry Radio. So they're like, we want to be on radio and <laughs> perform what we love. They're so passionate and they work so hard so we're thrilled to be here Thank before they perform but i don't know if you know this i know a couple of women grown women now who when they were in single digits they actually went to walam kung fu do you know who they are my do um 
I think so. I think the Mimi and Sia, your daughters. Like, my daughters, when they were little kids, went to Walam and Sifu Bob and you, and when you were a younger woman, taught them. And boy, did they love this thing. Participated in the lion dance and all that kind of thing. And you know, you know when you met my, I don't know, oh, actually, you had left already. We had the honor to be at Helen Chin's 90th That's birthday right. in Quincy. The great, great, great Helen Chin, who's been hugely important to GBH in addition to everything Certainly, else. Certainly, yes. Yep. And She's the, a legend. The lion dance starts, and a guy sitting at my table, Paul Watanabe from UMass, says, you really got to meet the woman who's running this thing. You'll love her. You love, and who was it? But you, after 20 years, we were reunited. <laughs> that was so great. And I, I was thrilled to hear about Mimi and Sia's life right now and um, to reconnect. I mean, Mima, Mimi and uh, Sia was not a part of the fetch uh, yeah. with Ruff the Ruffman. And we were in that segment together talking about Lion Dance and, and the background of it. So that was. You know, so tell us what back. we're going to see. We'll, we'll see. It. Tell us what we're going to see right now. So what you're going to see will be our four lions uh, played by our youth team members. Um, and they're going to be showing their strength and character, the spirit of the lion. And of course, they're going to bring the magic to clear out the space and really bring in all the auspicious energy. And um, I think they'll have a surprise for you, Jim and uh, Marjorie. I hope uh, so. During that, during that performance. And, um, and they're going to show what it is that they love doing best during Luna. The new year. Great. And by the way, again, run to youtube.com slash GBH News, even on your phone or facebook.com slash GBH News so right this. now. And here they are. Spectacular. Absolutely. Do you oh want to God. explain, for, just for listeners who may not have been able to, to the watch? The fools who did not go on YouTube yeah. or Facebook. Describe a little what we just saw in my do. So you see the lions here in different colors. Um, red and gold are the really prominent colors for the Lunar New Year celebration because of its high yang vibration. So you see our uniforms in gold and red. But the lions here, they came, they blessed the place. In gratitude of that, they were fed oranges and letters and also they brought you guys gifts. Yes, they did. Um, and tiny orange. Yes, yeah, so, so the orange is blessings and gold and, and, and fortune. And of course, the green, which you will always see during uh, lion dancing as well, uh, represents longevity and health and wealth. So so uh, we have it all Beautiful. here.
And by the way, one more thing, other than going to May May tomorrow, but sold out, so they can't even see the damn Lion Fan set. Where can people go to see you and your uh, people perform over the next week or so? I would say the biggest venue that we're going to be involved in is the MFA, so the Museum of oh. Fine Arts, on February 15th. And at that event, we usually perform the Lion Dance and Kung Fu uh, because we're a martial arts school as well. But this year, it will be so special because for the first time, we're going to be doing the Dragon Dance in honor of the Year of the Dragon. So don't miss out at the Museum of Fine Arts. I believe we're on at 5.30 and 7.20, two shows. That's fantastic. It's fabulous. We're talking to Mai Du from Walam Kung Fu and Tai Chi and Irene Lee from Mamie Dumplings. So let's get back to the dumplings for a second. Because, uh, <laughs> first of all, where the hell are they? That's yeah, the first question. They're coming. They're coming. They're, they're on, on their way. way. They're, they're on are? their way. Don't Is that worry. true on their way? Is that yes. true? Okay, yes. good. But I heard you doing the podcast with my dear friend and a frequent guest here, Shirley Young, and she talked about how dumplings in, in her life growing up were such an important thing for the whole family to learning to make dumplings. So give us a little background on why dumplings things are significant this time of year? Well, I think growing up in a Chinese American family, learning to make dumplings is a rite of passage. And um, making a dumpling that is to the liking of your um, intense Chinese mom or grandma is <laughs> part of that rite of passage. But the dumplings and being um, stuffed with delicious filling are symbolic of, of bags of money and wealth. And so the more you can make, the more you can eat, the more wealthy and prosperous we believe that you'll be in the new year. And of course, you can make and eat even more if you have a big group of friends and family around you. So it's the perfect celebratory activity as well. You don't want to get a kick out of it. You're both talking. Shirley, her parents came here from Taiwan. You're talking about growing up in a Chinese American family, about how your your grandparents might not be sure about your chosen profession, <laughs> <laughs> that you're not an engineer. Just two slackers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, your whole family has, has, has been usually successful. So what do you think your grandparents would be making of you now? Um, I'm sure they would still have things to say about the quality of our dumpling folding. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we certainly like to think that our grandparents would be proud of what we're doing. We've taken the legacy that they've created, which is all about love and hospitality, and tried to push that forward in new ways. By the way, we have mentioned your latest book, which you're on with us about, which I was using just this weekend. Oh, my Perfectly gosh. good food, a totally achievable zero-waste approach to home cooking. Yeah. I was skeptical at first. It is fabulous. It's oh, funny goodness. and fabulous. You know, Irene, I cannot believe you are not pitching. I went to your place about a month ago, and I got dumplings. And by the way, some really unusual ones, which yes. I love. Uh, but uh, and Maya is nodding in agreement. She probably has more expertise than I. I had a cheeseburger on a scallion pancake. Am I right? Did I get that you right? You are correct. One yeah. of the best things I ever had oh, in my, my life. Talk well, there about are, it. There are a couple of those en route. The cheeseburger scallion pancake I had nothing to do with and thought was a oh. crazy idea. Um, and then I came in and had one was like, oh, snap. So whose <laughs> idea was it? I guess we can it? keep these on the menu. Whose idea was it? You know, I think it was my baby cousin, Devin, who runs the classes and culinary side of our business. And um, yeah, if I leave him alone for too long, he, he does this wacky <laughs> stuff. So I was thrilled um, to find out that it was actually a delicious addition to the menu and um, we've gotten great compliments on it and we have some on the way for the team to try. Fabulous. By the way, and it's cheap. Is it okay to say cheap or you're not, that's not sure. the word you use. Yeah. Inexpensive. It's cheap. Inexpensive. It really is cheap. Can I change the topic for just a second? I don't Certainly. mean to be a downer here, but I mentioned the political activism you did. We talked a lot uh, uh, during the time of Trump, Trump and Kung Flu and this other racist crap about how anti-Asian American, anti-Asian hate in this country exploded. I know you did training for some self-defense training for people, my, who particularly older people. Has that abated? Is, is the, the anti-Asian animus in this country on the wane, or is it still as much of a problem as it was a year or two ago? Unfortunately, it is still as much of a problem. And in fact, it heightened during the pandemic simply because of all the uh, Trumpism that's happening yeah. around us. Um, and during that time, so many seniors, um, in, not just seniors, but I will say particularly seniors, were so scared to even leave their home to go to grocery stores or see their families. Um, and so I just felt the need to do something about it. And, and um, my, my, my team uh, and myself, we did a lot of com free community uh, self-defense training. And many thanks to the Boston Foundation Asian Community Fund, oh, good as for well them. as the um, AAPI Commission of Massachusetts funded us to, to do some more. So we're still doing those training in different parts of the, the state simply because um, we hear that folks are wanting to have this training to feel more empowered and to have a little bit of peace of mind. Is there, what, what's your sense, Irene, of the state of things on that front now? Do you share Mai's feeling that it's still a serious problem? 
I think, unfortunately, even though we may be seeing less of it in the headlines, um, at a community level, there is still a lot of fear. And we're hoping to host my for some self-defense classes oh, at great. May May oh, later fabulous. this year. We've talked about that. Yeah. That's great. And I think so much of why we do these cultural events and why we try to um, empower people to feel proud is so that they can have a sense of agency about their identity. So whether it is folding dumplings, defending yourself, feeling like you can walk down the street safely, I think all of that is how we kind of take pride in our culture and where we come from. Okay, Irene Lee, I want you to tell people, about, Jim mentioned your book, but the, the, the premise being using food that you, is about to go bad. Yes. You know, I, I think I heard on the podcast, maybe I read it, that you buy all the spinach. Oh, yeah. I didn't know you could freeze fresh baby spinach. Isn't that wild? Yes. It's, you it's, just it's throw a, it straight in the freezer. It's a life changer. And whenever you need some, it's there for you. Yeah. But tell, tell people the premise of the, of the book and the title of it. Of course. So perfectly good food. And I should say, especially as we're talking about Chinese New Year, the book is about zero waste, but it's also drawing on lots of cultural traditions from all over the world oh. where zero waste is, it's just called cooking <laughs> because yeah. Yeah. you don't have enough to go around. And so certainly in Chinese cuisine, there are many dishes that utilize off cuts, scraps, odds and ends and kind of wringing every bit of flavor that you can out of a dish. And so the book really draws on more modern um, techniques and modern technology using the vast array of ingredients that we have available to us and helping you save money, waste less food, and have more fun, really. Yeah. What's it called? It's called Perfectly Good Food, a Zero Waste Approach to okay. Home Cooking. I have big vats of spinach in my freezer now that Excellent. I'm ready to pull out little by little for, for your smoothie or your spinach salad, wherever you're going to do so it. So let's talk about the most important thing, I think, on the agenda today. You were here. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Are you the boss at May May Dumplings? No, thank goodness. What do you mean you're not the boss? You are the boss, of course. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the co-founder, and we started out as a food truck oh, yeah. with my big brother and we big know sister. That. Yes, yep. we met them all. And um, I now have two managing partners who run all of the details of the business, Annie Campbell and Alyssa Lee. Well, so, so is that your excuse as to why the dumplings are not here when you were here? There's got to be some reason Oh, yeah, for this. It's de that's definitely it's their fault. It, for sure. It's yeah, yeah. There's no. not traffic between here and <laughs> South Boston. <laughs> she got here, did she not? <laughs> okay, I'm going to do one more thing before I go. I'm sorry to bring politics into this because I know you can you are, are you willing to talk for a minute about this curriculum thing that you've been working on so hard or you don't want to do that oh, today? I, I would love the opportunity do you mind yes. talking um, for a in second? fact it's very much related to Lunar New Year celebration our team has been in many schools uh, Quincy Braintree Boston and and you name it, and to, to do celebration. But it's really an effort to uplift the students' life experiences and to embrace and really recognize their, their heritage mm -hmm. and who they are and, and that they belong. And so it's incredible to see Asian American students in their schools celebrating the biggest holiday for their families, which is a part of what um, my life's work is to um, promote uh, and advocate for a racially inclusive curriculum. I'm very um, much... Um, devoted to this work with the CARE Coalition, and we're trying to pass legislation to, to promote racially inclusive curriculum for K-12 oh, schools. Ill. Didn't a, one of, a member of your coalition ask, I just realized, uh, the governor at yes, the library yes, a question about Yes, yes, yes. Actually, a youth, uh, Alejandro. Oh, it was Alejandro. Yes. That's and right. Then, that's and right. then also uh, Mona uh, yeah. asked the governor, and yes, yes. If people want to find out more about that campaign, what do they do? Yes. Uh, please log into um, careforequity.org, care, C-A-E-R-E, -E, number for equity. four, equity. Oh, Number four. Yes, and and we hope that um, um, legislative leaders will move that out of committee. Uh, S two eighty eight. H542. Okay, before you go, you're on the hook too. You just came back from Washington I did, for a yeah. campaign around sub. Well, explain what you're doing in Washington. Sure. So I was in Washington um, attending a Lunar New Year celebration at the VP's house and also. Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> and meeting with, meeting with um, the Department of Labor and the EEOC to talk about the minimum wage in the United States and the tipped minimum wage, which I believe in Massachusetts is $6.75 an hour. And at May May, we pay one fair wage. So everyone makes at least the full minimum wage, which is 15, uh -huh. and we do tips on top of that. That's great. And the conversation is, is so 
complicated and layered and varies from state to state and restaurant to restaurant. And so I would love to come in and, and talk about it more. But Let's do it. we do support one fair wage, and we think that that is the direction that the industry is moving in. And it's going to be an interesting set of conversations. Okay, before you go, do you think dumplings are good for Super Bowl food or no? We're going to talk about the Super Bowl. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We're putting um, dumplings in pizza boxes and sending them all over the city for the Super Bowl. Are you really? So can't wait. Yes. And how do we find your place? How do we find Walam Kung Fu if people want to participate in that? They're my dude. Walam Academy. Dot org. Sorry, dot com. Dot com is correct. It's great to see you both. Happy yeah, New Year. Thank you we're really both. Glad that was such and a thrill your, to yeah, watch oh those kids. God, they were in young adults, I should say. That They're was fabulous. fantastic. Thank and you I for think I feel, I feel much less toxic energy now, Jim, don't you? I oh, feel good. about the same amount, but I'm just, <laughs> that's who I am. You know? it's oh, yeah. You're going to get all the lions to kind of surround you later. Thank you very, very much for your time and that a special treat. We've been listening and watching a lion dance from performers. From the Walloom Kung Fu and Tai Chi. By the way, that'll be online later tonight, I assume, for those who didn't watch it yes. live. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. We talk with founder and chief instructor Mai Du, as well as author and James Beard Award winning chef Irene Lee from May May Dumplings. Did, uh, they got an event tomorrow. It's sold out for the Lunar New Year. So I guess, but I'll give information anyway. If you want to book tickets or go in a future thing or check it out, it's MayMayDumplings.com. That's M E I. M-E-I, MayMayDumplings.com. Thanks to you Thank both. you so much for coming in. Great to see you. Okay, after a quick break, the Super Bowl is this weekend. You may know that. And with it comes Super Sick Monday. Super Sick Are you sick already Monday. planning your fake excuse to tell your boss why you can't come in on Monday? You're sick. Actually, you may have a hangover. Are you, and what are you going to eat and cook for the Super, Super Bowl game? Call or text us next. 877-301-8970. 877-301-8970. Eight nine seven zero. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, eighty nine seven GBH, and we are streaming at YouTube.com/slash GBH News and Facebook.com/slash GBH News. I'm Jared Bowen. Today on The Culture Show, while the Kansas City Chiefs and the 49ers face off this Sunday, we'll focus on what the Super Bowl truly is. A supersized cultural event, from the much-anticipated commercials to the halftime performances, some of which have become legend. This year does mark the 20th anniversary of Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction, to the three-layer dip, wings, and nachos that have come to be the game day mainstays. That and more on our Arts and Culture Week in Review, today at 2 on 89.7 GBH. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, offering Medicare Advantage plans with new benefits for 2024, as well as a broad network of doctors, hospitals, and specialists. BlueCrossMA.com slash go. And the Hanover Theater, presenting My Fair Lady, boasting classic songs such as I Could Have Danced All Night and Wouldn't It Be Loverly. Bartlett Shear's glowing production is on stage February 16th through 18th. Tickets at thehanovertheater.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. We're live at GBH's Fraser Studio. One guest, we were not at the library. You've heard we had technical problems. We hope to resolve them by Tuesday, and the mayor will join us there. By the way, if you were not uh, streaming either to hear the brilliant soloists who are going to be performing with the National uh, Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine tonight at Mechanics Hall, or to see the great lion dancers that came with my do, it'll all be online uh, later today at gbhnews.org. Super Bowl Sunday, I think you know this, is this weekend. Something like 125 million people watched last year's game, and with a Taylor Swift angle this year, it'll be even bigger. The day after the big game, as Marjorie said, I never heard of this till today, Super Sick Monday, as it's come to be known. The day when a whopping one-fifth of America and two-fifths of the BPR staff, by the way, layabouts Nicole Garcia and Adam Connolly, Aiden Connolly, <laughs> mysteriously <laughs> need to take the day off. New polling out from a group called Atera, I think, found that 41% of respondents would like to see, this is the most ridiculous thing ever, to see the Monday after the Super Bowl recognized as an official U.S. holiday. Forget about Election Day. 877-301-8970. So we have a bunch of things, all things Super Bowl. One, what is the excuse 
that has been most successful for you when you lie and call in and say you're <laughs> sick the day after the Super Bowl, and you're someone who feels less guilty about the fact you're going to be tuning in and supporting the National Football League, or you're resolved to start caring about concussions and CTE first thing Monday morning. 877-301-897. I was asking Irene about dumplings. Did you? I read a statistic this morning. In the United States, I hope I got this right, there are going to be something like 1.4 billion chicken wings eaten yeah. in the United people States love, during people, the game. People really love chicken wings. You know what I didn't know? What's that? The, the, the Super Bowl has been carried live in 190 different countries or territories and broadcast in over 25 languages. Well, it's like languages. a big cultural kind yeah, of event. Yeah, well, thing. I didn't think people outside the United States really cared that much about it, but obviously um, I was wrong. And um, a lot of people, millions of people, millions of people will be uh, will be calling in sick on Monday, coming up with excuses. Uh, and, and a lot of them have admitted to lying about being sick after the, after the Super Bowl. 11% of them are managers, so it's not just the people that well, are like... Good. At the desk, it's the people that run the company as well. 877-301-897. Before we take calls, did you see this column by this loser in the Lawrence Eagle Tribune a couple of years ago? The headline, <laughs> the title of this stupid piece from 2019 is You Eat Wings, I'll Eat Garnish. And this woman yeah. who wrote this thing for Lawrence Eagle it's Tribune. An there's a pic- column. It's a stupid column. There's a picture <laughs> of the woman eating a piece of celery mm-hmm. while all the rest of us... I can't read in my... Co- Who's the person who wrote this I think thing? that is an adorable-looking Zoe Matthews. That would be our Zoe Matthews. Her piece of celery. By the way, here's a picture of Zoe, uh, celery in hand, stuffing her face. Who eats celery on the uh, Super Bowl Sunday, you know? Someone who doesn't eat meat. I and guess that that's would be, the case. And that would be Zoe, and we're very proud of her. It's an excellent photograph, actually. It's despite an excellent photograph. Issue. 877-301-8970. If you're calling in sick on Monday, or at least contemplating it, what is your uh, line going to be? What are you going to say to your boss? You're going to tell the truth. You're going to lie, whatever. And and by the way, you know, it really is an issue. We've mentioned this before. Thank you. Oh, the dumplings arrived. Thank you. Oh, and the cheeseburger inside Sky and yeah. Pancakes arrived. You know, the CTE thing, we've mentioned this. Uh, one of our revs, uh, Emmett. Yes. Does not watch football, even though he loves football. I know. He's a, because he's, of the racism he's issue a, he's and true because to his of the principles. CTE stuff. How come, we, are you a fairly principled person? Well... Am I'm not, I a fairly I'm not, principled person? I'm not person? principled enough not to watch the Super Bowl because but I... How pathetic is pathetic. that? It's pathetic. Okay, well, fine. Let's move on from it then. 877-301-8970. What are your snacks of choice? Are you going to lie your way listen, out on Super Sick this. Monday? What's that? To call out sick on Monday for Super Bowl flu requires a note from the doctor at my job, says Doug and Worcester. Well, because the people, the employer knows everybody yell, lies about it. I know, but I mean, gee, you're going to make people get a note from their doctor? Do you think it should be a national holiday? No. Thank you. Yeah, why'd you have to think for a second there? Why'd because I, you know, a lot of people aren't <laughs> going to show up at work on Monday. They're going to have, they're going to be up. I mean, I wish the game would start earlier. Why does it start at 6 o'clock? not that late. Yeah, it's going to go on until 10, 30 or 11. Lots of people yeah. go to bed early. We just talked about this this week. All the Gen Z people that want to go to bed at 9 o'clock. Can I tell you one other thing that I'm really embarrassed by? And I really, I am really embarrassed by it, but I feel honesty is the best policy here. I am actually thinking a decent amount about how much we're going to see Taylor Swift, and I actually care about it. <laughs> I care about it. Is that like demented? Well, or is it's it not? a little, it's a little twist to the Super Bowl this year. I mean, how many times do you have the pop star of America uh, in a big uh, romance with one of the stars of the football team? Are you, to- do, you, do you care who wins? No. Uh, I, do. I know you're supposed to root for uh, San Francisco because if the Chiefs win, then the talk begins about whether Pat Mahomes, who's a brilliant athlete, the quarterback for Kansas City, is on his way to surpassing the greatest quarterback of all time, Tom Brady. I don't care about that terribly much. Uh, so I, I actually really don't care. Jim and Soton, you're next on Boston Public Radio. You're first, actually, on Boston Public Radio. Welcome. Hi. Hey, I just want to have everybody think outside the box and please make why why isn't the super bowl on saturday why you know, isn't Jim, the super that bowl is a great saturday? question what's the answer I, I don't know but let's go brandon so, oh jesus <laughs> what a loser thank you jim for your uh, stupid comment we appreciate it 877-301-8970 why isn't it on saturday well you know you might argue no, I, can, I, I can partially answer the question what? the reason huge events are generally not on saturday or on like the award shows is because more people are home watching however the super bowl is appointment viewing so if people were contemplating going out you know what they would do 
not go out so they can stay home and watch the Super Bowl. So despite that dumb second comment by uh, that caller there, Saturday would be brilliant. And then you just sort of rest up all day yeah, Sunday. You hurkle durkle in the morning. That's and, right. Yeah, what? 115 million viewers. I think that's low. But from what I understand, I know I read that in the piece we got today. I yeah. think it was a higher number. It's like half of the population in the United States that's sentient. Is that the right word? Well, it's also, it's also a cultural event, right? It's, it's, I mean, a lot of people, I've been to a million Super Bowl parties where nobody He's really watching the game. They come in and they watch the halftime show. It's going to be Usher this year. That should be really good. You know, you're supposed to watch the commercials to see what the good commercials are. But it's more about getting together and eating chicken wings, it seems to me. Can we uh, quote actually one of our colleagues? I think Aiden just looked up what the odious Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the league, had to say. The Saturday idea has been around for a long time. People have talked about it. The reason we haven't done it is in the past that simply, just from an audience standpoint, the audiences on Sunday night are so much larger. And again, it's because people go out on Saturday night, they generally don't on Sunday. So that's the alleged answer to the question. 877-301-8970. Do you read why Aiden's going to take the day off on Monday? No, what, what's his He's excuse? He's going to take his cat to the vet because the cat might be sleeping too much. I understand that. <laughs> By the way, the only that's true, but Aiden didn't finish the thought and say, that means he'll have to get a cat before Monday to take the cat to the uh, vet. Jim, Jim and Brighton, you're next on Boston Public Radio. Hi there. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you. It's great to talk to you guys. You too. Um, two thoughts, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, why it's not on Saturday. Honestly, college football has always been on Saturday, so that's why the pros were on Sunday. That's just a thought. So I think they've kind of locked into Sunday and just never let it go. Maybe. The other thing is, I've been watching this for 10 years, and frankly, we blew right through Martin Luther King Day. I was hoping for that. But we're one week away, and they'll make one more week of the season. We will get President's Day weekend, the Super Bowl, and a holiday. You know, that's another great idea. No, but nobody gets off presents. People get off from work on pre- You just go buy a car on well, presents. some people Day, do. No, they I do? Think a lot, I, think, <laughs> I think a lot of government offices are closed, aren't they? Well, wait a second. Is your point that since— it's All. What, what's that again? All government offices are closed on presidents. Yeah. Martin Luther yeah. King Day, some, st- some states didn't do the Martin Luther King, which I think is a travesty. But all things have been closed on President's Day ever. Okay, I'm glad you corrected me. Thank you. By the way, what, am I right in saying the last state in America to declare Martin Luther King a holiday was New Hampshire? I think you're right. That's how embarrassing yeah, is that? Yeah, I think you're right. Eight seven seven. That's another great idea. What's that? One more, one more week. What yeah. is your food of choice, by the way? I don't even know. How do I not know this? We've been together on the radio no, I'm not, 25 I'm years. Not really oh, that come organized. on! I hate when you do this. Kind I'm not. Of thing. I'm not that organized. Well, you're gonna eat something. You're well, gonna I watch will, a damn I, game. I haven't figured it out yet. Well, what do you you're think the, it's gonna be? What do you think it's gonna be? Maymay's dumplings that you just brought me right here. I don't think you're gonna save until Sunday. I don't think. The two so days I, is why? Well, I, okay, you fine. You probably put it in the microwave. By the way, you have the you? whole box of I the do. dumplings. I know yes. that you have the scallion. Sc- yeah, uh, I have one cheeseburger, cheeseburger and you have fifty dumplings. I, well, I'll give you some dumplings. I doubt that. The cheeseburger. So tell me what it's. I'm sorry, I'm interested in this. I, Before I, we get to the calls, what are you no likely to eat? Idea. Like a frozen banana, or I, what are you going to eat? I really don't. I, I'm you not don't a know. Big food plan. What did you eat last Super Bowl? You should be answering these questions because you are more into these things I am. than I am. What are you super serving on Super Bowl Sunday? What am I having? Your mm-hmm. dumplings is what I'm actually <laughs> having. Let's go to Matt in Boston. We're talking about Super Bowl weekend or Sunday or Monday or something. Hi, Matt. Hello. Hey, hello. Great uh, first-time caller, oh, long-time thank listener. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the plan is uh, I test positive for COVID, and later on Monday, I find out it was an expired test, and I test again, and I'm negative, but it's already passed, so I can work Tuesday. Can I tell you? That's a good one. You are a borderline COVID genius, actually. may come in handy That's for great. millions of Americans this year. You know, nobody ever asks me Matt, questions I love if that. you say, you know, if you have to, like, one time I had to call and cancel a dentist appointment, I felt bad, because usually I have to- Did you lie 20. and say no, it No, I did have COVID, but they usually 24 hours notice, you know, but- how could, about this guy? You can blame the hygienist. They don't How about have their hands This guy's mouth. idea. You've tested positive right. and you retest, and it was an expired test and it was a false positive. I think that's brilliant. Enjoy Monday, Matt. Thanks for your first call. Call us again soon. 877-301-8970. Did you know that they, which makes sense, it would be a great break for the people in the What's service, on? that they play the uh, overseas military bases. They show the Super Bowl to everybody that's over there, and sometimes they're watching in the middle of the night, depending on where they're stationed. Don't you see them always? They always flash to military, yeah. active military So you could be 4 people. o'clock in the morning watching yeah. the Super Bowl. Well, Super Bowl's a fairly big thing. Do you know that? Are you aware of that? Uh, no. It, it, well, it is a big thing. Like I said, it's a cultural event, so even if you're not into football... 
Although we do have some people that say they are that they can't stand football, barbaric sports. Says Kristen from Worcester, so she will so not. So she's not watching. I'll be watching, but nonetheless, she prepares food for the day. Is there this a puppy bowl? Or buffalo or cauliflower. Yeah, somebody buffalo else said that. That's what they were doing. Fabulous. That's what they were doing. They were not going to be watching the Super Bowl, but they're going to be watching the puppy bowl, and they find that a uh, very fun. That's what is the, the puppy bowl? Um, I think the dogs race, these little puppies race across the floor and stuff they like do? that. It's a riot. Yeah. Yes. And that, well, they're all, I mean, who doesn't love puppies? They're really cute. That's true. And it, of course, it usually does solve if you've only watched the puppy bowl, which is on earlier before the game. It is. You might not get a hangover and have to call in sick. Let's go to Greg in, Fox, in Foxborough. Oh, Hi, my Greg. goodness. Quiet year this year in Foxborough. Yeah, Greg. Right. Yes. Hey, hello, both of you. Hello, Marjorie. To you. That was a prescient. Uh, observation you made there about overseas uh, yeah. in the military. I wanted to relate a story back in the 80s. Uh, I was in the U.S. Army stationed in Korea, which is like 14 hours ahead of us. And so the game would come on, I don't know, maybe 9, 10 in the morning on Monday morning. We unofficially every year had a day off. They gave us the day off because they knew everyone was going to be watching Anyway, that's great. So that's great. Year, Sunday night, Sunday night was a drunken, you know, I mean, it was just a great party. <laughs> Monday morning, everyone's drunk watching the Super Bowl. And it was, it was just quite a holiday. So, so Greg, holiday. when that's you're stationed, good story, when you're stationed in Korea and you're watching the Super Bowl, do you do the chicken wings and the chili or, or what's the deal? I don't I don't even think chicken wings was a thing back then. Yeah, maybe not. Um, maybe not. Alcohol was the thing back <laughs> yeah, then, none correct? Of us, none of us could cook, but that, it absolutely was. So potato chips, yeah, definitely. Potato Probably chips. Nachos <laughs> How pathetic. Like okay, nachos Greg, and beer. thanks for the history. Uh, we good. appreciate it. Thanks. Enjoy Thank the game. You. Thank you very on, much. Uh, Can we get return to this issue of principle for mm-hmm. a second? We shouldn't be watching. We shouldn't. I don't mean to be a killjoy because you're supposed to be into that. I mean, really, we read that story. We did that story the other day with, uh, with uh, Trenny about how th- literally thousands of, thousand plus former NFLers who are suffering from dementia and whatever are screwed even when the NFL's own doctors I certify know. them as qualified for these special benefits to the tune of like hundreds of millions of dollars. So what's wrong with us? Well, I mean, to make a difference... Um, I suppose you'd give up the whole season. And this, the Super Bowl is kind of a cultural Do you event. compost? I do. So that's, I mean, that's a small act, is it not? In the grand scheme of things, one woman compost thing in Brookline is not going to make that much of a difference, but you do it, right? Well, I do it, but I, like I said, I feel like it's kind of a cultural event. You watch the you watch the commercials, you see the halftime yeah, show, everybody talks about Usher. the Super Bowl. Yeah. Usher, that should be really good. Uh, yeah, he talked about how he's won all these awards, but the Super Bowl was is something he really wanted to he's do. He's not a kid either. He's in Wait his mid-40s. I yeah, I saw him uh, interviewed by, by someone, I forget who it was, and he's got this unbelievable house is looking over. Usher does? Yes, looking over. Shocking. It's about 10 miles outside of, I think it was Las Vegas, or maybe it was Phoenix, I don't know, but you could see all the big high rises, this beautiful. great porch, and this great pool. Your one solution is, is if you're concerned about the concussion thing, is watch the game, but don't enjoy it. What do you think of it? You think that's a... Well, you know, it, 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 listen, the games leading up to, I'm embarrassed to admit, I watched the games, the playoff games leading up to the Super Bowl. Yeah, and they were, they were great games. Who are you rooting for on Sunday? Uh, Kansas City, of course. And why is that? Because you, you never oh, know what's going to happen with Kelsey. Taylor Swift. You know, you never know what's going to happen there. 877-301-8970. Ned from Woburn, thank you for calling. Hello, Ned. Hey, long-time Hi. listener, first-time caller. Another great one. Thank um, you. I, I told my staff and I told my area director I'm using the sixth day on Monday because not only is it the Super Bowl, but it's also Fat Sunday. Mm. Oh, Mardi Gras? We, we, Mardi Gras. So I have a little sing dig at my house, and I've been doing it annually to carry on the tradition. So our munchies are fried dough and fattening foods, and that go along with Super Bowl. So it comes in really well. Combine the two parties together. Tell us okay. what some of the fattening foods are. Yeah, we want to know are. about the fattening foods. Absolutely. Let's see. I got a lasagna ready to go. That's great. Um, I do have a vegetable soup, but the big Oof. the big thing is fried dough. <laughs> fried to, dough. To fried dough is great. Now, hold yeah. on for a second, You have to Ned. dip fried dough in some, or you don't? Uh, well, lots of times it's got sugar on it. Oh, sugar on but it. But do you sugar. make the fried dough, or do you buy it someplace? No, I make it. You I do? I like to make it um, the Azorian way and uh, kind of do it every year to keep 
you know, keep it going. And, and you Okay, know, so describe the Azorian way to make fried dough. Is it got, is it got a, a cinnamon sugar on it? Uh, you can put whatever you want. Usually they put sugar. Yeah. Um, some put molasses. Yeah. Uh, I just like sugar. And, uh, you know, wine goes with it and... You know, you basically stuff your face for the day. Yeah, I love your <laughs> resolve. So, you really, you're a man who knows what he likes. It's like there's such certainty in your voice. Enjoy Sunday. That's pretty great. He's not yeah. going in Monday. He's already told everybody. Ned, thank you very much for the call. We appreciate it. You know, we do have people that are texting us that are saying they're, they used to watch the Super Bowl, but they don't anymore out of principle. But, I hope that's true. Do you, I hope well, it's true. Well, I'm from Rentham. Yeah, okay. I used to watch, not anymore. <clears throat> Don't mistake the Super Bowl for the World Cup, real football. Can't believe the stat about the uh, uh, SB being broadcast, Super Bowl Super being Bowl. broadcast all over the world in 190 countries. How many countries are there, by the way? I don't know how many countries I think there are. There are. How many, I think there are 190 uh, countries, aren't Jim, there? Jim, I don't know where Missouri is on a map, so don't That's ask me. Point. I think it's no, broadcast in Missouri. Yeah, and this gentleman said he grew up in Asia and we couldn't care less about what sport was played in America, but apparently people care about it care about it now. We have time for one oh, more. Oh, oh. No, we don't. Our work repi- requires a picture of the COVID test <laughs> to get out of work on any day. Well, but, but you don't save old COVID tests? Save old them? Old positives? No. You don't? <laughs> No, I don't, Jim. Well, some of us do. I'm glad you've and by said the way, that. For a no small, will believe you when you for call For a small sick. fee, I could share one okay. with you if you'd like. <laughs> okay, do thank We have time. You we don't much. have time. We're really sorry to everybody, and but we wish you luck, and I guess we wish that you have a good Super Bowl, whatever that means. So the Puppy Bowl is at, uh, February, it's at 2 p.m. in case you're That's interested. That's right. Thank you very much, everybody who tuned in today to the Boston Public Library. I hope you enjoyed it. You can keep up with us 24-7. We're a podcast. We're going to have a, uh, a long, we have a long one and a short one. Mm-hmm. That's a half hour. Yep. And versus three hours. Tune in Monday, we've got the head of BU's journalism department, Brian McGroy, used to run the Boston Globe, the Ground Truth Project's Charlie Sennett, our food policy analyst, Corby Cummer, the Reverends Irene Monroe and Emmett G. Price III, and NPR TV critic Eric Deggins. Oh, great. Our crew, Zoe Matthews, Aidan Conley, Nicole Garcia, Hannah Loss, additional support from Ethan Kotler, our engineer is John the Claw Parker, our executive producer is Jamie Bologna. Special thanks to GBH engineers who made this special streaming broadcast. Yeah, did a great possible. Job. Uh, it was. It worked out really well from Fraser. 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 Okay, sorry about that. Is this a beautiful room, it's or is a it a beautiful room? room yeah. Matthew Glover, uh, Tia Modalis, Antonio Oliar, Glenn Heath, Terry Quinn, Bradley Lewis, Colin Cockrell, and Sai Patel. Stay tuned to GBH 89.7 for the Culture Show's Week in Review. That's right after us and the new news. I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Jim Browdy. Thanks again for tuning in today. Hope you can tune in on Monday. Have a wonderful Super Sunday and uh, a great weekend.